the American compromise that we reached where in you know the Constitution, where we made it so that the federal government would not have an established religion, but the state governments would, led into the state governments not, and into us just kind of believing that, that we should just allow every type of blasphemy, heresy, witchcraft, and whatever else to just run wild. Yeah. My guest this week is Pastor David Reese, and he's the pastor of Puritan Reformed Church here in Phoenix, Arizona, and the CEO of Armored Republic. He's also had a hugely positive impact on me because he introduced me to the Westminster Confession of Faith. Now, if you're like many Christians today, you probably don't know what the Westminster Confession of Faith is. Perhaps you don't know what confessionalism is. Maybe you even think that expositional preaching has something to do with sermons about punctuation. But confessionalism is the heart of Protestantism, which is why as soon as a, quote, non-denominational church throws out their confession, it's not long until lady pastors are kicking Bible footballs before the laser light show rock concert and the pirate ship baptisms. The creeds, and especially the confessions, are designed to prevent that madness. It's just that, well, being a truly confessional church is hard. It hurts people's feelings. Because the Bible has a lot to say to men and women about our roles relative to each other, our responsibilities, and our common sins. It has even more to say to feminism. And we wouldn't want to offend the true spirit of the age, would we? Though, of course, that's not the only reason. It's just that the world is very much with us. But the way is narrow, and we don't like that. We never have. Out of one tree in the entire garden to not eat from, we chose the wrong one. But I've got an idea. Let's shoot the messenger and throw out the confessions entirely. Problem solved. Now hang up your rainbow flag outside, dust off the Sparkle Creed, and let's go. Sparkle Creed. I believe in the non-binary God whose pronouns are plural. Though as we all know, that just creates more problems and ultimately, tragically, fails to solve the problem that the gospel was given to us for. Like many, I didn't know how to think through these issues until Pastor David introduced me to the Westminster Confession of Faith, which changed my faith forever. It was like an arrival. Because I understood that woke, feminist, drag queen, Batman crucifixion, LGBT churches aren't Protestant, like Roman Constantinople say they are. The proper term is apostate. The confessions, whether the Westminster or London Baptist 1689, are how we know that's true. They are the fixed, immutable standard we can measure by independent of the rulings of councils and the proclamations of sinful, fallible men. You may have heard Pastor Michael Foster and Pastor Doug Wilson talk about the Westminster as well. They're big fans. So this is your chance to hear about the Westminster in depth. And for my Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox viewers, you can get your questions answered from someone who isn't your priest. Because I'm sorry to say, guys, from what you tell me, they're not giving you the whole picture. And it's my hope that this conversation sets the stage for more thoughtful discussions and reflections for my Protestant viewers as well. In our conversation, Pastor David and I discussed the high watermark of the Reformation, modernism, liberalism, socialism, and the church, councils, apostolic succession, and the word of God, the three basic questions of philosophy, an overview of Protestant church history, pleasing the women versus leading the men, knowledge, holiness, and righteousness, and finally, the solas, the trinity, tulip, and the incarnation. If you enjoy the Renaissance of Men podcast, thank you. Please like this video, share it, and subscribe to the channel. Plus, leave a comment down below, and let's nerd out about the Westminster Confession of Faith together. And please welcome this week's guest on the podcast, the pastor of Puritan Reformed Church in Phoenix, Arizona, and the CEO of Armored Republic, Pastor David Reese. Pastor David, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast today. Brother, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. I enjoyed talking to you last time when we had a quick conversation about business, Christian business. That's right. Um, and I'm, I'm excited today to be able to you know, talk about uh, about theology in a you know, systematic way. Yeah, that was. I remember that was at ReformCon. That was really great. That was. No, that was. Uh, I think running into you that was kind of my introduction to your to your show. And uh, you know, we just had a conversation. And afterward, I was able to go through some of your content and find a lot of really neat stuff. And I've also really been enjoying uh, keeping up with the show uh, recently. So I'm, I'm really glad that providentially we ran into each other and um, have, have been blessed to be able to see a lot of your conversations and appreciate your, your thoughtful format and, and platform where you, you have good long conversations. 
Thank you, sir. That's uh, that's that's very moving to me um, that you said that. Thank you. I really appreciate that, especially because things have grown so much over the past uh, year and a half. And those were some of the first in-person interviews I'd ever done as well. Um, so I, I appreciate you sitting down. And thanks also to Amber, who introduced us, as I recall. She she facilitated that. So thank you, Amber. Um, and, and also, I appreciate you saying that because I want to thank you. Uh, today is also, it, there's sort of, it's providential that we're having this conversation today because as we speak right now, I have a tweet kind of going viral about the new age, about this new age singer, you know, kind of hippie girl who was singing the song. And I kind of laid out, hey, this lifestyle that she's promoting is false and demonic. Um, but the end, the real end of my journey of faith, I guess we'd say, was when I discovered the Westminster Confession of Faith. As I've been thinking back, you know, over my over my time exploring theology, searching for God, you might say, um, the discovery of the Westminster, the reading of it, was felt like a real arrival after a long time on the road, you might say. And mm-hmm. so uh, you were the one who introduced me to the Westminster Confession of Faith. So thank you for for doing that. So it's it's uh, it's providential that we're having this conversation today as I'm reflecting on where I've, where I've been to, where I've arrived, arrived to and where I'm going. Praise the Lord. It's uh, an honor to have been able to be uh, of use to you in that way. And I think, I think, you know, one of the things you talked about this idea of kind of getting to a place of, uh, you said kind of ending into the journey or, or sort of a resting place. In a sense. Uh, right. And obviously we're always growing, we're always maturing um, and the church is maturing. But I think, I think what you said there is a really important, uh, important thing because, you know, as Protestants, we believe that the Scripture is the ultimate authority. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's this sort of, sometimes you can take that and you can say, well, if we believe in sola scriptura, if we believe that Scripture is sufficient and that it's the ultimate authority, nothing else is, we can sometimes despise helps. We can sometimes yeah. despise teaching of pastors, and we can sometimes despise pastors meeting together in councils to be able to discuss things and the, the assembling of, of words in that way. Um, but uh, what I want to, to to do is just briefly say, if anybody goes and reads Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the very end, Solomon talks about how the words of the wise are like goads. And so goads are meant to kind of poke us along. Mm-hmm. Um, and he furthermore says that that the idea of of the the words of the masters of assemblies, I'm just translated as scholars, but it's the masters of assemblies, uh, like assemblies of the church, um, the words of the masters of assemblies are are ordered by one shepherd. That they are that they are words that are given to us, um, and they're given to us for the purpose of helping us to be able to um, to be able to come along and to be able to uh, to grow in knowledge in an efficient way. Because uh, of the making of books, there's no end, and there is wearisome to keep reading, reading, reading. And so the the Lord, in providence, in His maturing of the church helps to collect the work of the church in sort of these confessional types of works. And that's where you capture this point of where the church has matured to mm-hmm. at a particular time. And so it kind of gives you a landing pad that you can rest on as you then seek to prepare to keep climbing. Mm-hmm. And, and so that idea of how it made, you know, how you felt when you got there, I think is, is actually exactly the way that they're designed to be. Uh, you know, you have like you know, Nicaea or Chalcedon or, uh, the, the work of the church, uh, for example, at the Council of Orange, or, where you're dealing with these difference between the Pelagian and the Augustinian controversy, and you have this sort of capturing of the set points. It's almost like the checkpoints in a video game, uh, mm-hmm. where you know you kind of can you have this place where you can go back and you're able to build from there. So I think that your experience is exactly the type of relief that that the Lord of the Church uh, intends for people to have uh, with those helps. That's that's amazing that you phrase it that way because. The way that I've described it to people was um, that being in the new age is a lot like swimming in the water, right? Like maybe the water can be cold or the water can be warm, but <laughs> the, you know, or maybe it's like jello sometimes, but there's no place solid to put your feet down. Like it's always, it's always shifting. It's always moving. There's new practices being syncretized, new things to explore. There's no place to stand, but uh, reading the Westminster confession and, and, and experiencing coming to understand it the way that I've described it. It's like, this feels like, like cool stone that I can just Mm -hmm. like lie down on and be safe on. Like it's a solid place to stand. And that's, and so when you say that, like, it's a, it's a landing place, that's literally how it's felt after so long (laughs) with something else. So um, there you go. Amazing. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Yeah. 
So um, let's let's. I want to start with a couple of things. So I, I'd like you to talk first, if you if you would, about your background a little bit, because I usually introduce my guests, but I find it's better, you know, in this context to let 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 my guests understand uh, introduce themselves. So I reflect the background properly to make sure people who are listening to this be like, okay, why should I why should I listen? Like, you know, so if you could mind talking about your background a little bit, that'd be very helpful. Sure. Um, okay. So. Uh, I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor of a church in Phoenix called Puritan Reform Church. Um, we hold to the Westminster Confession of Faith. Um, we hold to the larger catechism and shorter catechism. We have uh, the Directory of Worship, also from Westminster, um, and the, the form of government uh, presented there. It's called the Presbyterial Form of Government. Um, and so we, we have, these, um, we have these, these documents that are our are, are doctrine, worship, and government, um, and our effort is to say that we believe this is, you know, Biblical uh, and is captured there, and so that's something that being concerned about confessions, being concerned about a, a covenanted uniformity, um, those are those are things that are sort of odd in our day. We, people mm-hmm. typically think of confessional standards and stuff as being sort of dead letters uh, or maybe kind of useful but not taken too seriously. Um, and so I, I lead a church that is very concerned uh, to 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 seek to have a confessionalism and a confessional. Uh, seriousness, um, what we call covenanted uniformity that we'll talk about, I mean, more uh, as the show goes on. Uh, but the, also, uh, apart from that, um, I have a godly wife, um, uh, her name is Katie, um, and she has been a wonderful helpmate to me. Um, she is gifted in ways that I'm not, and I'm gifted in ways that she's not, and we are uh, very able to work together uh, in a helpful way that has uh, just, in my life, uh, marriage was very sanctifying, very helpful, uh, make it so I was way more productive. Um, and we have six children um, that we've homeschooled. And so we've divided up work there. And um, uh, she obviously deals with most overwhelmingly uh, the, the stuff that occurs in sort of the younger ages. And then as the, the kids get older, there's increasing involvement from me um, and sort of trying to bring the kids into not only dealing with um, – you know, learning about theology and history and, you know, pushing them on math and stuff like that. But, but also um, this idea that, you know, there's, there's an old Jewish saying that if you don't teach your child, if you don't teach your son a trade, you teach him to be a thief. <laughs> and so that, that idea trade. of trying to, to pull, <laughs> to pull the, the, the boys in particular into learning business uh, with me. So um, I am not only a pastor, but I'm also uh, the owner of, of a portfolio of Christian businesses um, and what I've been doing is trying to to build cultures where they can be explicitly Christian, both internally and externally, um, and to kind of uh, to say we need to do business to the glory of God. Um, and so I think that the business is a part of the household and needs to be governed by the Word of God. I mean, the church and the state need to be governed by the Word of God too, but but the idea that you build out Christian businesses, and I think that a big part of the dominion mandate uh, is to is to make property um, and to then see that property governed by the Word of God. And so my desire has been to, uh, to to basically pass along wealth and wisdom to my children and to institutionalize that in various ways um, and to seek to, uh, to honor the Lord with the covenant institutions of governing myself as an individual, as a, you know, seeing my household govern that way, our church govern that way, and to desire to see reformation in the state. Um, and so I, I think that accumulating capital and building Christian businesses is a big part of that. And so I think when you and I met at ReformCon, we talked about the Geneva strategy a bit, mm-hmm. um, and that idea of, of gathering Christians and resources, and seeking to project out Christian power into the world in terms of both the messaging, but also seeing that property is governed by the Word of God. Um, so those are those are my my passions. Um, I'm seeking. I want to see reformation um, in the land, uh, and to and to try to work towards those things. So that's who I am. That's what I'm about. That's what I'm concerned about. Um, so praise God. Well, I can, I can say for everyone listening that having been to your home, having been to your church, having interacted with you for, for many hours, you know, in, in person, just man to man. And also in groups, I can say that, you know, you, you live, eat and breathe the things that you believe. And it's been deeply inspiring me to, uh, to me to, to see that. So I can validate for everyone listening that this is the man knows what he's talking about. And so it's why I've been looking forward to really, this is why I've been looking forward to this conversation because, um, um, I had a feeling that you would be able to bless people listening with the understanding and the way that you've blessed me. So, so thank you for, thank you for sharing a little bit about that. Praise the Lord. And real quick, we mentioned Amber earlier who, who had introduced us um, and her husband uh, before they were married, I had a, I had a really great introduction to him. 
Uh, I think it was a different uh, event that was at going on an apology. I can't remember. It might have been a debate. I think it was a debate. It was. I think there was a debate on baptism. Infant baptism. And he yeah. walks up, so he introduces himself. We, you know, <laughs> we have mutual connection, and we're talking. And he goes, "So I can tell that um, you're overweight, and what needs to happen here is you need to take care of that." <laughs> right? He yeah. worded it a little bit differently than that, but it was about yeah. that bold. And I was like. This guy's a man, yeah. uh, and so 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 Sean uh, Sean O'Brien uh, ends up kind of saying what we you know, he, he does physical uh, fitness training. That's right. So he started to to help me to do stuff and do weight training um, and stuff like that. And that, that was almost a year ago now uh, mm-hmm. that I started doing that, and that was really significant for me. I immediately lost some weight and stuff like that, but also just the discipline of exercise, uh, which had not been a part of my life. That was an area I knew I needed to reform and deal with, and I just. Uh, you know, uh, Amber has, has been a blessing uh, to, to me in my house, but also Sean has, and he helped me so that I had kind of failed in leading some of my sons, for example, in doing physical training. And it was really a huge blessing to have him come in and bring his gifts in uh, mm-hmm. and to be able to help to do uh, that and to help to get my, my boys involved. And since then, I've got my younger boys involved since we started doing uh, martial arts training and some other stuff. So that's been another thing. So sorry, I just wanted to, I wanted to plug Sean O'Brien's uh, uh, business because uh, he's, he's a big blessing too. Wonderful. Well, I came from training him uh, well, with, with him this morning, so I'll be sure to put in an ad for Sean O'Brien that'll be coming up in probably just a minute. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, That's exactly. great. That's great. Yeah. So shout out, Sean. Okay. Well, thank, thank you so much for that, uh, Pastor David. I appreciate that. We all do. Um, so let's, let's, let's start digging into, let's start digging into the confession. So I remember when you and I sat down for coffee over here in central Phoenix, you explained the Westminster Confession of Faith as the high water mark of the Reformation. It was a whole big history lesson, and it took me a while to sort through it in my mind, but like, I remember that very clear, the high water mark of the Reformation. Let's, let's start there. So what did you mean by the, the high water mark of the, of the Protestant Reformation? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so this idea of a high water mark, right, is, is there progress that's occurring in the church? Right, so that's one of the basic questions. And so how you, how you look at history is a really big deal. What does the Bible teach? Does the Bible teach that history is just kind of a circle where you're just constantly repeating things. Um, and a lot of people go to the book of Ecclesiastes and they read it, and it's like, oh, there's nothing new under the sun. And they I kind of understand the Bible to be teaching, that there's yeah. there's sort of this almost like repetition thing, but then eventually it's all going to be kind of done on a day of judgment. And one of the things that's really important to get is that, um, you know, there's a beginning, a creation, and then there's also judgment day where history is going to be examined in detail and explained for us in a way where the progress is shown and everything is taken into account, um, and, and there's, everything's meaningful. So as opposed to this view of like, oh, there's nothing new under the sun, and everything is sort of meaningless and vanity, that instead actually things are maximally meaningful because they have everlasting consequences, and they're all going to be known by everybody, mm-hmm. right? All the hidden stuff's going to be you know, projected from the housetops. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that's the case. So you go, Ecclesiastes actually gives us two ways of looking at history. One is under the sun, which means, um, you know, sort of this from the perspective that there's nothing higher than the sun, so to speak. And the other one is under heaven. And so under heaven, in the, you know, this is under the rule of God. And it's not just acknowledging God exists. It's acknowledging that the God of the Bible is the true God and that he will judge and that everything is meaningful in displaying his glory. Mm-hmm. And so if that's the case, then history is progress history is going toward a goal. And so that means there's going to be progress points and those progress and there's going to be key moments, decisive points where where there's like consolidation of progress. And those decisive moments of of consolidation or progress um, before the completion of the Bible would have been sort of, you know, as there's sort of prophetic uh, capturing of the information. But since the completion of the Bible, what we have is sort of the work of the church to sort of consolidate the controversies that have been uh, been touched on and de- dealt with, and to organize the information to make it so that it's more efficient for the church to deal with in the future. Um, and so those those check marks, those those checkpoints, those those places where we we hit to, those are the high water marks, and we measure where is the water, where is the tide, where's the current culture now compared to there. Mm-hmm. And so what we want to do is we want to see Reformation when the church declines. We want to see it rise back to where it was, be able to consolidate there, and then to be able to make new gains mm-hmm. and to keep going. And so our goal is to have increasing amounts of truth communicated more clearly 
in a more organized way and to find out how to do it with conciseness. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, people look at the Westminster Standards, look at the Westminster Confession, the first word that comes to mind is typically not concise. However, when you look at it, Mm -hmm. when you think about the amount of information that's communicated, Mm -hmm. the clarity of it, so that it touches on so much of what the Bible teaches, it is impressively concise and Mm -hmm. well-organized. And so, and people kind of, don't want to don't want to learn a significant or large chunk of doctrine. They think like this is too much to expect of people or whatever. And that's why it's important to differentiate between you know milk that should be given to babes and meat that should be given to the mature. Mm-hmm. And so you differentiate those. And that's why, for example, there's a shorter catechism and there's a larger catechism. Right. Yes, catechism. there's the little one <laughs> compared little one. to <laughs> this. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So, so the larger one is, is is an attempt to give the meat in an efficient way. Now, obviously, you should be studying the scriptures and judging it all by the scriptures. But but so you know, if we think about were there prior points where there were sort of these high water marks? Well, Nicaea, right in the 300s, was was capturing the work that was done in the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, and there was a work of a lot of people, a lot of individuals. And the same with Chalcedon, capturing work on the doctrine of the Incarnation. And so you kind of get these things, and you pro- progressively capture that. And this pulling together makes it so that you can consider the disputes that have come before in a far more efficient way. And so for people who, who, who can, I don't have time to obviously go through these in the show, but I just want to mm-hmm. point out to people, there's sort of this idea of hitting the high watermarks in this sort of idea of counsel. Uh, in in the in the scriptures, and so Ecclesiastes twelve talks about the idea of the words of the masters of assemblies, mm-hmm. um, and the ma- the idea of assemblies comes out of Exodus eighteen and twenty four. You have elders and representation that occurs. And you have sort of the idea of representation at the local level, and this sort of this gradual rising, this graded rising that occurs to have more and more churches working together. So you find that in Exodus in eighteen and in twenty four, you can see that applies to church courts. And the idea of church elders. Um, you get to Acts 15, you have a, a, a new covenant example of that, mm-hmm. um, where there's this discussion about circumcision and you know, the Old Testament law and how all that works together. And so there's this council at Jerusalem that works through some disputes and tries to deal with things. And the idea of the church striving by the work of officers to become more mature um, is dealt with in Ephesians 4, and it's also applied to individuals. Mm-hmm. And in Philippians 3, you have this idea of None of us have reached the, the point of maturity that Christ was at, but the church needs to be striving towards that. And so for those of us who are mature, Paul talks about those who are mature, in other words, who are at the point of maturity the church has already reached, they need to be helping to see the church matured further toward the goal. So the goal is Christ's maturity. There's the idea of where the church is right now, and there's like individuals where they might be. And your goal is to get individuals up to where the church is and then to help the church to keep going. Mm-hmm. So your new disciples, mm-hmm. new converts are being helped to be brought up to the level of maturity the church is at, and then when they are mature, they're supposed to be helping to move the church forward further. And so that's this idea of progress in history, that the church actually is maturing, and that there's a way of measuring that maturity in terms of how has the church advanced, how has it captured things, what's the high water mark it's reached. So it may be more than you bargained for, but Hopefully that's no. useful background. No, that's fantastic. So, so I have a couple different questions from that then. So the first question is, um, so if it was the high watermark of the Reformation, and, and, and would you say that we've receded quite a bit from that high, high watermark, the church has receded quite a bit? Yeah, so I believe that there's been significant, what's the, the term that's normally used from, from people who sound angry like me uh, is the word declension, right? So you go, you, you, got, you can, you can really, you can really grimace when you say declension. Yes, can you, you feel? Can. can you feel how that allows for a grimace to come declension. on? Rogan? Mm. <laughs> right there, you yeah. go. There you go. You could, you could do it too. So there, this, this <laughs> idea, of de- <laughs> this idea of declension um, is, is that you, know, it, you can, you can tell the word, right? Declining, right? So you mm. have the high water mark, and declension is, is receding away from the high water mark. So I think what happened is. Um, you, you kind of there's there's a major event that occurred in academia in the 1600s, and mm. then there's also beyond that there's sort of the cultural ramifications. And so you know doctrine controls what people do, right? What you believe controls what your goals are, controls what your choices are, and um, and that that occurs on an individual level. It also occurs on a corporate level in terms of the way cultures are shaped and formed. So in the 1600s, one of the things that happened is that we, we we kind of we escaped, you know, the clutches of Rome, where 
the, the church had been oppressed and, and pushed down by the traditions of man um, and the papal authority that existed, but there was this sort of rising um, of Enlightenment thought or Renaissance thought that was distinct from sort of Reformational thought, and the Reformation would put itself on saying what the Scriptures teach and all the necessary inferences therefrom mm-hmm. um, is the system of truth revealed by God. And whereas on the other side, you might have sort of a humanism that asserts that human experience and human reason apart from divine revelation is something that might be an authority to be dealt with. And so the efforts to mix these, to blend them in the academy, um, became sort of dominant. So in the university setting and all that, that became more and more dominant. So that, that occurred with the bringing of Aristotle and bringing back Thomas Aquinas and uh, mm-hmm. some of the efforts to kind of pull in um, this idea of using human experience as, as a measure, so that man is the measure of all things. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and what happened ultimately in the late 1800s is that view dominated even in the Protestant uh, seminaries and, and universities and everything. And so you ended up with that becoming the dominant view, which resulted in all of the institutions, all the denominations, all the seminaries, all that kind of stuff being taken over, but what were called the modernists. Um, okay. Say more and about so, that. So, so the liberals you know, kind of took over the institutions. And th- that relates to Fabian socialism and the long march to the institutions and all that. But but that's sort of a part of what happens there. And so now what we've seen is, you know, the fundamentalists or the Bible believers or the conservatives, whatever you want to call them, you're trying to, re- right, I, I'm one of those. Right, <laughs> right here. <laughs> so this this sort of like effort to rebuild institutions. And some of the ones that we've built as, as sort of conservatives or Bible believers quickly refell because we don't really know, if we don't, if we don't diagnose the disease, if we don't know the you know, the etiology of the error, mm-hmm. right, then we, we can't properly cure it, and we just put the same disease back into the new institutions. Mm-hmm. And so that idea of, of sola scriptura, or scripture as the, as the sole ultimate authority, um, if that's not properly dealt with, and you still try to marry it with science or something like that, then you end up with sort of um, this, this effort to have two masters. Mm-hmm. Um, and so anyway, so that's, that's my understanding of where, what, where the declension came from in terms of the academic elements, and then what we saw is ultimately churches even stopped disciplining people who were teaching those errors by the late 1800s in most cases, and that's when the institution started to really collapse quickly. Um, and so uh, th- that's what I think happened, and there was a declining away that started in the late 1600s and escalated uh, until that kind of what we see now. And so I think we're gonna we have a you know multi century century type of solution that has to occur. Yeah, uh, but people can enjoy the fruit of that like tomorrow. Uh, they mm-hmm. start to work in their own homes and their own lives, but it, it it sometimes takes a long time to see reformation on a broad scale happen. Uh, besides that, it can also come quickly. The Lord can bless things magnificently, but we've got a lot of problems going back for a few centuries. Yeah, I, it makes me think of the book Christianity and Liberalism by Machen. That maybe he was describing some of these things. Yes, uh, that, that's a that's a great point. So yes, that book is fantastic and and really accurately does that. Where he's laying, he's saying. In the Presbyterian Church of his day, there were two religions. There was Christianity and liberalism, or yep. what could be called modernism, mm-hmm. which was the assertion of, of the scriptures being subordinate to human reason, human experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there was actually a, there was a pastor on Twitter yesterday talking about you know, some of the social justice causes of the day and how that's real Christianity. And I was just listening to all that, like, yeah, that sounds like liberalism. That sounds like what Machen, Machen was talking about 100 years ago. Go figure. Yeah, so uh, that, that's great. Good diagnosis. So, yeah, I mean, like, it, like here, just read this book. It's a couple hundred pages, and, and you'll. It was refuted all a long time ago, two thousand years ago. But who's counting? So, <laughs> so okay. So then, my second question is: so one of the things that um, that I exist in, you know, in my content creation and my my say uh, networks is uh, Roman Catholics and, and Eastern Orthodox. And um, so I want to, and, and they are making a very strong push on both. Uh, Instagram and Twitter on, on social media, probably on TikTok too and, and everywhere, f- you know, for um, for believers who are uh, uh, disaffected, disenchanted, disillusioned with a lot of uh, woke Protestant churches. So it's not hard to understand why people might be looking for something else. And, you know, what I've had to work through some of these questions with your help as well to understand why what Rome and uh, Constantinople offer is uh, is not correct. But one of the things you talked about was the Con- Westminster Confession came together because of a council, right? So what makes the council that brought together Westminster Confession of Faith 
an authority or any authority compared to the councils that say Rome and Constantinople would say those are their authorities? What's different about the Westminster Confession of Faith Council or the, uh, the Westminster Divines, let's say? Yes, that's a great question. So the difference between a legitimate council and a, and a false council um, is, is, first of all, you have to go to the more basic question of how do you know anything? The most basic question, how do you know anything? And so if we go, okay, if the authority is the Word of God, then we're going to judge councils by the Word of God. Now, um, part of that is what is a council? A council of a church is a court of the church. Um, and so what it's, it's doing, these councils, they have the authority to judge matters of dispute that come before them. They have the ability to settle matters of, of, of conscience, to be able to deal with kind of things as there's discussion about them and through their process of debate. Um, and the goal is to organize doctrine according to Scripture alone in a way that is systematic to kind of make it easier to teach people through that truth that's clear, organized, and the goal is to try to make that concise. And so um, the other thing is to, to see worship rightly done and to see the government of the church properly ordered and to be, to be administered properly. Mm-hmm. And the idea that there are, is a place to appeal. So if, if in a local church there's an issue, then the point of appeal would become a broader church court, uh, a council that's more than the council at the local level. Mm-hmm. So those are, those are the ideas there, and, and those, would, those obviously require a number of texts of Scripture to demonstrate that Acts 15 is one of the easy ones, and again, Exodus 18 and 24, pointing to the idea of, of councils or, or elders um, being in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Um, but so this this idea that you have councils that are, are part of the church. So it's the courts of the church, and therefore you have to judge a church. You have to judge the church and judge the council. And so if Scripture is the authority, the way you judge a church is you say, is its doctrine according to what God has taught in his word? Um, and two of the really basic ones to go on there is, does the church itself teach that Scripture is its authority? Um, that Christ's kingship is manifest in him giving a word to us and that word governing us? Mm-hmm. Or does the church pretend to have the authority to give that word or make it authoritative? Like, does it require somebody with a special hat on to tell you that this word is now God's word? Like, when Jesus said it, chair. not authoritative, but now when the guy in the chair with the hat on says it, now, now it's authoritative. <laughs> yes. So and then the other thing is, you know, you, you look at the gospel— that's taught by them, right? And you go, what must I do to be saved? What do they teach there? And the Scripture is very plain about that, right? And so the Scriptures very plainly teach us that we are guilty in our sin and that we need the death of another to pay for our sins. We need the death of Christ to pay for our sins, and we need his righteousness to cover us so that we have standing before God, Mm -hmm. and that faith is, is the alone instrument by which we're connected to the righteousness of another. And that that faith is a gift of grace, that God gives it to us by the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's all done to give all of the glory and salvation to God alone so that only he gets to boast and not me or the Pope of Rome or anybody else. Mm-hmm. And so that idea uh, that, that it is that the gospel that's preached and the doctrine of authority, those are the most basic things to judge um, on a church's doctrine. Then you look at its worship, you know, and, and, and one thing I would say that's pretty easy is, you see the second commandment, it tells us to not make graven images, um, and to not serve them or bow down to them. So if your church has you bowing down to any statues, then I would suggest to you that that's a pretty obvious on its face form of idolatry. And we can talk about other types of idolatry, but on a basic level, how, are we worshiping God in the way he's commanded, or are we inventing it, or using the doctrines and traditions of men uh, to worship God? Mm-hmm. And the third one is going to be the government of the church is the government of the church in the way that God has appointed, um, and is that government serving or lording it over the people? Mm. Um, and if they're serving, they're going to take the time to deal with things like dealing with disputes, hearing out the various sides in those disputes, trying to provide public forums for the resolution of dispute if they can't be resolved in private so that the court of the church can hear out something and deal with it. And then the elders are going to be able to give an authoritative judgment according to the word of God and call a person to repent, right? And, and then ultimately also, before a person is excommunicated, you have a vote of the people. Uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians that 
uh, the the discipline that was given out, the, the punishment that was given out to the guy who was excommunicated. In, in First Corinthians, he says, "Hey, this guy's sleeping with his stepmom. You need to kick him out." Mm-hmm. Then they kick him out, and he repents, and the church doesn't let him back in. And in Second Corinthians, Paul says, "He's repenting. You should let him back in now." Um, mm-hmm. And he says that you know the, the the discipline that was given by the majority, the punishment that was given by the majority, was sufficient. Um, and so the majority of who? The majority of the church. And so that last step of excommunication, one of the ways you check the power of officers is by the people throwing their hand in it uh, by, by voting on it, the, the heads of household do. So those are things to look for. If your church doesn't have those things, then what you end up with is the tyranny of government that's not according to the government established by the king, worship that wasn't given by the king, and doctrine that wasn't given by the king of the church. And so it's a, not a church, it's an illegal assembly. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so it's Rome and the Eastern Orthodox are both illegal assemblies that usurp the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you can judge them by the Scriptures. If they claim to believe the Scriptures and what they teach contradicts the Scriptures, then those councils are teaching error. Mm-hmm. And so so I can hear the uh, the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox men that I know saying, but we have apostolic succession. That's what they say, is that our councils, we have the, the, we have the apostolic succession, which means that we gave you Scripture. So what's the, what's the response to that? I've worked through all these questions. I just want to hear you say them because you can articulate them and you have done it so much, so much better than I can. <laughs> so, well, praise the Lord. But I, I think the, the, the main thing to, to say here is when the scriptures were given by God and given by prophets, were they authoritative then or did, it, did, did we have to wait for <laughs> Nicaea or, or, or some pope somewhere? Like wh- when was it? Like when did that happen, Right. And so when, when, when you literally have like a voice, right, like, like, for example, when you have like the burning bush and God's voice is talking to Moses, right, and, and Moses like writes it down, right, and, and you go, okay, when did that become authoritative? Was it when God said it? Right? Well, yeah, obviously. So, and then if God chooses prophets, right, you have like many of the prophets, many of the prophetic books begin with like in such and such year, you know, the word of the Lord came to, and then it lists the prophet, right? It's just like, it was the word of the Lord then. And, mm-hmm. and so this, you, you have Peter referring to Paul's writings as scripture. You have, um, you have the idea that uh, there's, an acknowledge, there's, there's the, the choosing of the apostles. There's, there's the sending of them out, the fact that they're going to remember Jesus' words. Jesus is teaching himself as authoritative. Right? It just, this is, this is a... This is an infantile interaction with the Bible. When, mm-hmm. when Rome claims to have to give it authority, if they say, we gave you the Bible, you go, no, God gave us the Bible. He chose prophets and apostles, and he gave us the Bible, and it's self-attesting, and it's self-canonizing. Like, as it's being written, it is words being given to us by God, and it's canonized then. It's self-canonizing. God's word is the highest authority. There's no authority above it. The church is not above the word of God. That's blasphemy. Um, and so, and the Eastern Orthodox, if they want to claim, you know, Rome has this three stool, sorry, the three legged stool, right? They say, they say, there's the scripture, there's the church, the teaching authority of the church, the magisterium, and then there's holy tradition. And so they say, you know, but the Pope is the one who controls the church. No, no council is legitimate unless the Pope approves it. Um, Okay, great. So the Pope, not the universal, not the ecumenical councils. And then you go, also, the tradition is that which the ecumenical councils approved by the Pope um, are, say, is holy tradition. Okay, great. Mm-hmm. So the Pope controls tradition. And then the scriptures are approved by the Pope, given to us by the authority of the church, and furthermore, are interpreted by the church. And you can't interpret them by yourself. You don't have That's private right. judgment. That's right. And if you try to interpret them, your interpretation is is sort of your your you know mad hair interpretation you know off on the side and unless the pope or the, the magisterium of the church has authorized that interpretation of the text it's not authoritative well the problem with that is okay well can i read and interpret the you know encyclical uh, letters of the pope or can i <laughs> yes or, you know, and so and you go okay well no you have the bishops to do that and the cardinals i was like oh cool great thank you can i can i interpret like the, the sermons and letters from my bishops um, and they go, oh, it's what you priest for. And you go, oh, can I, if I'm listening to the priest give a homily before the mass, can I interpret that? 
And, and this is sort of like, oh, am I an authoritative interpreter of that? You know, wh- wh- how do I deal with it? So you, you, this issue of you can't interpret the scriptures, you, you, you're not educated enough, you end up with this need for an infinite series of interpreters right. coming down. And so, and that's intentional. It's designed to make it so that they can tell you anything and you're required to believe it. Mm-hmm. It, is, it, is, it, is, it is clerical tyranny. It, it, is, it is priestcraft that is designed to control the people. And so either you can understand truth uh, that God reveals and believe it uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and you can judge the teaching that's given to you by the Word of God, or there's something else that's above the Word of God. And so I want everyone to understand the Pope is claiming to be God. He, he doesn't say that in exactly that way, but he claims to be the Vicar of Christ, which is a title of the Holy Spirit. He calls himself Holy Father, which is a title of God the Father, and he also claims to be the Supreme High Priest, which I'll tell you what, is a title of the Lord Jesus Christ. He usurps and steals the titles of God and claims to have authority over the things that only God has authority over, and it is stolen. It's usurped. And so he's an Antichrist is the language of the shorter I mean, of the Westminster Confession is that he is opposed to Christ and he apes Christ. That's what that means. Anti is against, but it's also in the form of aping. And so the stealing of these titles and the opposing is is a is an act that is Antichrist. So uh, that's that's what I would say there. And and we we find with Eastern Orthodoxy uh, that what happens is their claim is that they have. You know, holy tradition, and they have scripture, and maybe scripture is a subset of holy tradition, mm-hmm. and the church is to defend and maintain this holy tradition, but you end up with their church interpreting the tradition, because they, they have competing traditions, right? You have like, well, in Russian Eastern Orthodoxy, or in Greek Eastern Orthodoxy, or Armenian Eastern Orthodoxy, whatever, right? You end up with all of these different, you know, these different Eastern Orthodoxies, and so then they, they claim to go back to the apostolic succession thing, right? Mm-hmm. So this, that, that question of Who's got the right series of hands being laid down? And did they did they hate Polaroids when those were happening? Right. Uh, you know, like were there, were there pictures? How, how do they know which ones have which one? And so the scriptures nowhere teach us that the way we determine which doctrine to follow is based upon who got the hands laid on by the right guy. Mm-hmm. There there is this teaching that the scriptures have the idea of ordination, which is the setting apart of a man for for service for public office, and the symbol that's used for that is the laying out of hands because it symbolizes setting apart and and it, and transfer of authority. Those are the things it symbolizes. Mm-hmm. They're symbols, though. Men can be true officers without ever having received that sign. This has always been the Reformed position. The, the biblical and Reformed position has always been that a, the, the essence of ordination is the setting apart of a man for public ministry. And uh, so you can you can find that throughout the you know, Reformed history discussion of that. But the, the other issue is that you go, well, is that scriptural? Well, yes. In Scripture, what you find is in the cases where you have some sort of a situation like an emergency or or the original formation of things, you have people being set apart so that you can then have a succession. But things can happen where you have to kind of go back and restart something. So, for example, in the in the in the Scriptures, you have the times of Reformation and recovenanting, like Hezekiah. When he finds that they find the text of of the scriptures again, maybe maybe it's Deuteronomy, maybe it's the whole of the Torah. But but the point is, they find they find some portion of scripture. They're reading it and they realize they're not keeping Passover, um, mm-hmm. and so they repent. They start keeping Passover, but they realize that they can't keep it in time because the the priests aren't ready for it. And so there's a provision in in the law that when you're not ready, that there's a, you're as an alternate date. It's like a month later. So they do that, and so then they they're going to the month later, but still the priests aren't ready. And so they don't have enough priests to do the Passover stuff. So what they end up doing is they devolve the authority of the priests to the Levites, the next in order in terms of that sort of work, and they have them do the work of the sacrifices. Mm -hmm. So you have the devolution of authority there, and that's to deal with this kind of emergency scenario. So the scriptures recognize that you have times where the guys that have the hands laid on them and stuff like that, they're not ready or they're not in place or they've lost the right to do something or they've been kicked out or whatever the thing is. So the scriptures have a process of the devolution of authority and they use their own standards to to judge and to test these guys. And Jesus was so often in conflict with the religious authorities. I mean, the, Mm -hmm. the highest court of the church condemned the Lord Jesus Christ being moderated by the high priest (laughs) <laughs> and so, you know, they condemn the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the, that, that synod, I think, was an error. 
Yeah, I think so. I, I, okay. Yeah, I think I feel uh, feel confident saying that. So that's wonderful. You said so many things that I want to reply to. Um, the first that I want to touch on is um, is about interpretation, like private interpretation. Doug Wilson has a great new book out called Papa Don't Pope, and uh, I listened to it on audiobook, and he brings up the same he brings up the same objection, like. Uh, but at a, at a lower, at, at probably the maximum low level of, gran- of granularity, which is like when you're choosing a church, you are engaging in private interpretation. When you're in choosing mm-hmm. Rome or Eastern Orthodoxy or a Protestant church, you are engaging in private interpretation of which church is correct. So you can't avoid it, right? So, so to trying to avoid it and to say like, I can't interpret scripture myself, you're still and always interpreting down to that fundamental decision. So, so as, unless you're just like a robot being, being kind of dragged around. So he, he, he talks about that in that book. So, um, so this is really great because I, I want to um, give some of the questions back in response to that, that that I've encountered from Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox. Okay, so so you break away and you have all this private interpretation, and now you have forty thousand denominations. So all that you've done with the Protestant Reformation is introduce chaos into the church. Right? So what's I have my response to that? But I'd like to hear your, your response as well you know, as well, uh, the response to the private interpretation that you're now, quote unquote, enabling, the people can read the Bible for themselves, oh no, um, is leading to fragmentation. Yeah. And so I I would say, so first of all, the reason people have started churches and had a bunch of different denominations is because they don't like what the Bible says. Yes. So so the the, the Bible is a a document that is clear. Yes. Um, The Bible is, is, is something where People just reject the very plain teaching of the Bible, yeah. and it happens over and over and over and over again, um, and that has always happened. Um, and so th- that's always happened. And uh, and what we the issue is those who are faithful. The what the way to get to unity is to is to seek to use word, sacraments, and prayer, and all of the ordinances of God in a holy way. And and you pray for unity, like the Lord Jesus Christ did in John 17, and and you seek it. You seek to debate things. So the process of coming to agreement is the process of debating. It's the process of much discussion. Mm-hmm. And so you have to debate the scriptures. And when you read the scriptures, you have to interpret it using the objective, internally defined methods for interpretation. So you're looking for a literal meaning of the text. Okay. So if it says, you know, if Jesus says, "I am the door," you're going, "Is he literally?" a like eight foot by four foot plank of wood. <laughs> yes. Like, you know, and so when, so you don't, you know, you, what you're doing is you're going, oh, that's a figure of speech. And what is the meaning of that figure of speech? Uh, and so, so that you're looking for a literal meaning of a figure of speech or of language that is, that is more just prose, right? So you're trying to figure out what, what does it mean? Then you're trying to use the rules of grammar to help to direct that. So as opposed to being like, I feel like whatever, when I read this verse, and you go, what, no, 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 what does the grammar of the text communicate. And and so sometimes you're going to find things like there's like pronouns like he, you know, which, you know, there's lots of fun things to say about pronouns, but but just <laughs> to stay on track, uh, the idea that he, uh, is, who is it referring to? Is it referring to Jesus or Paul or whatever? Well, you, you use the rules of context to govern that, right? So you're going to read the context, the prior sentence, the sentence that follows, where, you know, the paragraph, the, the book as a whole, where do things fit in the book? And then you're going to look at things like how, where, what are the other books of the scriptures, and where do these fit in the context of the other books? So that you're looking at the whole of scripture, and you're looking for the context of something in scripture inside of itself. And lastly, it's going to be read in a logical way. So you have, you're looking for literal meaning. You're using the rules of grammar to interpret the words. You're using context to properly understand and to choose the proper interpretation using a search for literal meaning, the rules of grammar, and then the idea of context. And lastly, we're going to read it systematically. And what does that mean, logically? That means you're reading it in such a way as to try to make it cohere with itself. As opposed to like looking for ways to make the text of the Bible contradict itself, you're trying to see, is there a way to make these things cohere? The word, the scripture cannot be broken, is what Jesus says. Mm -hmm. And so that means when you're reading it, if you're reading two passages in such a way that they look like they contradict, the problem's in you and not in the text. Mm-hmm. And so what you need to do is you need to search the scriptures and look at the more plain places and, and put them all together and all that, and you read them in such a way that they cohere. So mm-hmm. if the, the problem is not that there's, that, that, that there's uh, 
you know, that without some sort of central bureaucracy that has an infallible infallibility to it, that we're going to splinter. Now, the problem is that human beings are going to splinter because they don't like the truth unless they repent and believe. Mm-hmm. And so what needs to happen is a reading of the text at, honestly, and what needs to happen is an effort by those who believe the text to faithfully apply it and to pray for God to bring blessing. And we also need to seek to unify around a high watermark rather than participating in the declension, because mm-hmm. that's unfaithfulness. When we, when we participate in the declension rather than rallying around the high watermark, what we're saying is, no, Lord, that's too hard. We need to find a rallying mark that's easier. Like, let's go back to the third century or fourth century rallying mark, and let's rally around Nicaea or, or Chalcedon as opposed to the covenanted uniformity that's been attained to. And so the result is that we, we try to throw away the progress and say, well, we're, we're going to remake that progress later. And I'm saying, no, I think our duty is to rally around the high water mark. And as we rather rally around there, it, it builds more and more, and, and if the Lord blesses that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's that's what I would say is the process, and that's my answer to the objection. So then, um, fantastic. And um, the 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 uh, quote unquote objection then is like, wow, that sounds like an awful lot of work, right? Like, and, and like respond to that as well. Like, I have my answer again, um, but I'd like to hear yours, and I'll give mine. Sure. Um, so I think that the the answer to that is the good life is a is a life of work. Amen. Um, and, and so you, you don't, it doesn't require you to have everything figured out that the church has already figured out in order to be saved, right? Being saved comes through simply believing that the, the word of God is true and that the very minimal gospel that, that, the, you know, that the Messiah that God has sent, the seed of the woman, crushes the head of the serpent um, and that he has saved us by his mercy right? that, as a substitute. Um, and you're going to understand all sorts of outworkings of that as time goes on, and you're just going to have enormous amounts of stuff you're figuring out. But we we seem to treat whenever these discussions come up, everybody's like, "That's so much work." You expect that from like the newest believers? Like, no, I don't expect that from the newest believer. Why you change the subject? Mm-hmm. What we're talking about is what should the churches do? And we're talking about what should the pastors of the land do? The most mature. What should the most mature do? Mm-hmm. What the the guys that have been selected to govern? What should they do? They should hold to a confessional standard. They should uphold it and seek to rally people around it and to disciple them according to that confessional standard. If they don't think it's what, if they, if they think this confessional standard is false, then guess what? They should stop confessing it. And they should instead rally around whatever they think is, is the high watermark. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so that's the basic thing is the good life is a, a life of increasing responsibility, a life of work that we glorify God by seeking to know him more and more. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, and it is the glory of kings to seek it out. And so what do you want to be? Amen. Amen. That's what I, that's what I say to men as well, because I've been in these discussions, even amongst Protestant circles, even in my men's group, you know, sort of around six day creation versus evolution or versus various, you know, around various troubling passages. And what I say to the men is that if you encounter, if you're doing daily scripture reading, that's the first important thing. Not just like I found this online or someone sent this to me and I don't know what to do with it. Like you have right. to be actively engaging with the text under your own energy and under your own enthusiasm every day. So it's, so it's a part of you, right? So that's mm-hmm. the first necessary first step. But if you encounter a text that is troubling to you, the first thing, as you said, thank you, you phrased it beautifully, which is to say, how does it cohere, right? How does this, how does this make sense? Not like it doesn't make sense, no, the scripture is the word of God. It's all from one voice. It's all from God. It all makes sense, right? It's all part yes. of it. It's all one big pieces of puzzles that fits together perfectly. And it's on you to figure out how that fits and approach that verse or that text or that chapter or that book, right? You look at it as, a, as God reaching out to you, inviting you on a journey to understand how he's trying to reach you personally through that text, right? Because a text that one man might be troubled by wouldn't trouble me. Like, yeah, that makes sense. You know, others, they might not like, you know, the six day creation account in Genesis and maybe trying to say, well, that six days is actually six eons. And it's like, well, maybe, but like, go look into that yourself, accept the challenge, accept the invitation as something that's going to grow you up spiritually. And don't just say I'm troubled by it and walk away. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what you just said there, the different troubles for different people is a really great point because what the Lord does is he shows us where we need to be sanctified with that. Mm-hmm. Where rhetorical paradoxes are in the Bible where you'll have things where, for example, it'll say like, 
you know, answer a man according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Don't answer a man according to his folly, lest you become like him. It's like, those are verses one after the other. Like, that's <laughs> yes. a rhetorical paradox, right? So when I was it's an apparent of... contradiction right there in the text on purpose. It's like, figure it out, mm-hmm. right? And that's, yeah. that's what it's there for, is to make you go, wait a second, how do I reconcile these things? Mm-hmm. And there's stuff like that all over the Bible. And that's why I think, that, again, that, that verse out of, out, of, out of Proverbs 25, God conceals things for his glory, and he causes men to seek to figure it out, right? It's the glory of kings, to seek to figure it out. It's, it's a part of the method of drawing us out, but it's also a part of the, the method by which he causes history to have this sort of gradual progress. Um, and so we have progress in our own lives, and there's historical progress. But I think, I think this idea that like we want it to be super easy, like you just want like, people just handing it to you all the time, it's just like, that's the, that's, you, you don't think God has a right to make it so that there's a struggle? Right. And, and doesn't the, doesn't willingly, enthusiastically engaging in the struggle, let you internalize scripture in a way that you wouldn't, if someone just spoon feeds it to you. Like I fought with this verse. A good example for me is God hardening Pharaoh's heart before destroying Egypt. It's like, well, that I was really troubled by that at first. Like that seems really unfair. Like I'm going to harden your heart just so I can destroy you. Like that's cheating. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. Right. But someone had to explain to me, um, that the hardening of the heart was giving Pharaoh over to his desires, was removing the restraints that had always been put on him. It wasn't like God going in like, ha I'm going to make you stubborn just so I can destroy you. It's like, no, I'm going to take my restraining hand away from you, give you over to your own desires, which is already what you wanted to do, which is equivalent with hardening of the heart, right? The heart of flesh versus heart of stone. Once someone explained that to me, I was like, oh, that makes perfect sense because I thought for a second that seems really unjust, but it's, it's perfectly just. Sure. But even that, I mean, going back, like, you know, God predestined that, obviously, right? From sure, eternity sure. past. And so you deal with all that and you just go, God is the potter and he has yes. the right to make from the lump of clay a vessel for honorable use and a vessel for dishonorable use. Mm-hmm. And he does it to display his justice, right? And so that that idea that God is the sovereign one, um, as well as the fact that we have nothing good in us, right? And so when if God doesn't restrain our evil, we're just going to go, you know, headlong into more evil, uh, I think both are true, and and I think that there's no standard above God, right? He's he's the just one. He's the definer of justice, mm-hmm. um, and so there's not there's not like a there's not a judge above God, and there's not a law code above God, right? He defines what's good, and what he is is good, mm-hmm. um, and so I think I think that on a, on a on a on the deepest level, the definition of what's good and the idea that there's no judge above God. And that what he does by definition is good, I think, is the ultimate answer for that and the problem of evil as a whole. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but and then also the fact that yeah we're we're accountable for our own actions and the fact that God predestines them doesn't remove that accountability. Mm-hmm. In fact, you know he it establishes it. He's the creator. He's the determiner, and he's the one who gave the law code to judge us, and he's the judge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's no there is no security anywhere else. There's none. There's no solid foundation anywhere else in the world to stand. I've looked. Believe me, I've looked. Outside mm-hmm. of the Word of God, there's no place else to stand. Outside of God's sovereignty, there's no place else to stand. And 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 again, that's that's why the things that I've learned from you, that's why the Westminster Confession has been so powerful for me, because it taught me how to stand there. It was it was through the membership course at Apologia that I first heard about Calvinism and struggled mm-hmm. with the idea of, of limited atonement. And that was the first thing that really was like, oh, that, I don't, I don't know how I feel about that, right? So sure. the, let me, let me, tr- and and so my approach to that was like, well, let me trust these guys as knowing much more about this than I do. Like, I'm not just gonna walk and say, I don't like that. You're wrong. <laughs> like, what do I? I don't know. Like, okay, that's cool. Let's encounter this. And it was a, it was a sermon by Vody Bakum who talked about how the way to think about that is imagine we're all going over the falls. You know, after the, after the fall, everyone for all of human history is all condemned, period. The fall wasn't the fall, it was the crash, as Doug Wilson calls it. Congratulations, Adam and Eve. Everyone to come after you is now, is now destined for death. But mm-hmm. in God's sovereignty, he chooses some people out of that stream going over the falls. He chooses some of those people for himself, which is his right as God to do. Why does he choose right. them? Nothing in us it's purely his own grace and mercy and his own sovereign choice. And once I got that, it was like, it just drove me down to my knees, glorifying God, giving thanks because I, I understood. And I have found no place else ever to feel the same safety and security and peace to know that God makes promises and he doesn't revoke his promises yeah. and, and, and that what I've been given is a gift. 
And so now, you know, on Twitter and various other places, like I talk about this openly, like repenting from all of my past beliefs, like making my life a living sacrifice in exchange for the gift of eternal life. And the idea that, you know, once saved, always saved, people don't like that. Or the idea that somehow I chose God or something like that. These Arminian kind of ideas, like there's no, secu- there's no security in any of that. There's none. Right. There is no peace with God in any of that. Instead, the peace with God is to trust those doctrines of grace, even if it doesn't make sense to you. Even if, but, and that's, you know, the potter's freedom. Again, go ahead. Yeah, no, and, and I think, I think assurance is impossible you can't be assured of your salvation in a way that's going to that's going to last um that's make it so that you're not you know think, so what's going to keep you from you know despair at night when you think about your own sins you know, it's like oh, you know, are you thinking i'm just going to have i'm going to will to constantly stay in the faith mm-hmm. or are you relying upon the fact that i've been given the gift of faith uh, jesus is the author and the completer of mm-hmm. my faith um that he he gives it to us Nobody can jump out of his hand. Nobody can be taken out of his hand. Right? There's no. There's nobody that has been given that's going to be lost. Mm-hmm. Um, and so these promises um, that you know all who are justified will be glorified. Uh, you find these these in the in the text of Scripture and it provides assurance. And apart from that, there is no assurance of salvation. So it allows us to have gratitude to do good works out of. So, but that that idea I would ultimately say you know as far as the understanding part goes, um, you know you can't believe a thing if you don't understand it. But you because you know understanding and thinking it's true those things mm-hmm. together what you think and what you and what you understand what you and what you think is true that combines what you believe mm-hmm. and so i think that you might not understand how it all fits together but you might understand okay G- jesus you know only died for the elect okay that limited atonement okay uh, is that just i don't know how that's just like okay so maybe you don't understand how to reconcile those two things and you're trying to figure out which one, if, if they contradict, or if you're just seeing a contradiction that's not there. Um, and then secondly, you're trying to figure out, okay, if they do contradict, then at least one of these views is wrong. Mm-hmm. And so then you're trying to figure out which of the things are wrong. And so if your view is first that Jesus only died for the elect, and secondly that somehow it's unjust if Jesus only died for the elect, you're going to examine which of those is true. Uh, and Because if Jesus is good, he's not doing anything unjust. And so then you go, okay, you figured out, you know, by the Holy Spirit illuminating your mind and by the study of Scripture and talking to your pastors, you know, you came to understand, oh, it's not unjust. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so, so that that resolved a piece of it. And so I think when you think things don't make sense, that's when there's an indicator that there's something there to work on. You need to chase mm-hmm. that down. Yep. Um, and th- that's the marker for something that needs to be chased down. And that's that's a glorious journey. It's to say. Yes. Right, it doesn't it doesn't make sense. I don't understand it, but I'm I'm going to trust that the teachers that I have are wise and experienced and I'm not just going to dismiss them because it doesn't make sense. I'm going to see if I can make it make sense to me. Right? And and I Yes. I, go ahead. And you, and you search the scriptures. We, 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 you know, Paul went to Berea and those who listened were of a noble mind because they searched the scriptures to see if it was so. Mm-hmm. So you're, if you have a pastor that's teaching you some doctrine and you don't like it, not liking it is very different from it not being true, right? And right. and so not well, liking not it is not a good people, reason. Well, not to a lot of people, right? Right, I mean, that, and, right if, if, if you're the arbiter of truth, then what you like and don't like, I mean, if you're God... Yeah, feelings are sovereign today, right? Right. Yeah. So, so if, if, instead of, if instead of saying, what do I like, if instead the question is, what's true? Mm-hmm. And if your pastors preach something and it and it hurts your feelings, then what you should ask yourself is maybe that's a marker of sin in me, mm-hmm. right? Um, and you search the scriptures to see if it's so. Now, if it's not what the scriptures teach, then you need to be willing to stand on the word of God mm-hmm. and to and to oppose pastors. Um, but at the same time, you do that in a way that's following process, right? Where you go through the discussion, you go through much discussion, you present your case. You hear their position, um, and you go through discussion. And that discussion process, uh, you know, a man, you know, a man sounds right until, you know, his neighbor's examined. And then mm-hmm. when you examine the other guy, you go, oh, well, maybe, maybe it wasn't that clear. Um, and so I think it's important to, to go through discussion, to go through debate. Um, but you judge the pastors by the word of God. But don't throw off a pastor just because you don't like what he says. Uh, mm-hmm. Judge what he says, and if it's true, then repent of not liking it and start liking it. 
And this is another big difference between uh, Protestantism, or certainly the Reformed tradition, and Rome and Eastern Orthodoxy. We're encouraged to ask questions. Debate is encouraged. It's not silenced. It's not, I refer you to the council that is the authority on these matters. Like, you can raise your hand. It's like, excuse me, like, pastor or priest or whatever, like, you said that, but that's, where is that in the book? (laughs) Right? Like, don't do it during a sermon. Like, go approach them personally, right, first, right? Unless it's really bad, I suppose. But, like, we're encouraged to ask questions. Iron sharpens iron. That's, 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 I hear that verse once a day. (laughs) And so today, this is the once a day that I'm hearing it. But the, this idea that, that the faith progresses through refining out heresy, right? That, that the Reformed right. tradition is as sophisticated as it is because it's encountered heresies, it's debated them, it's argued them, sometimes, I guess, violently in various expressions of that word, and has resolved them to purify doctrine closer with the word of Scripture. And that conflict is part of the process, it's yes. part of it. And it's an, it's like godly, righteous conflict. Like arguments are okay. Quarrels are not. We're having a good argument until a quarrel broke out, right? Like that's, the, I think that's C.S. Lewis. But to, to, to lean into that and to have these spirited discussions about disagreements of doctrine respectfully, right? Honoring each other as brothers in the faith. Like we don't all have to handle everything as if, you know, it's uh, we're in Geneva in the 1500s. It doesn't have to be like that. We're not. That's part of it. And, and I think as men, we should be encouraged to have conflict in our prof- godly conflict in our professional life, meaning if we have to achieve, we have to push, we have to compete, right? We have conflict mm-hmm. in, our, in our personal lives in terms, of, um, in terms of whether it be like playing a sport or conflict against a barbell or something like that, right? That's a, that's, that's a manly form of conflict. Naturally, we'll have conflict in our relationships, but approach it with a spirit of reconciliation. And I think it's okay to have conflict righteous conflict theologically. And that's how we refine our own understanding and not to be afraid of it. But we also have to show up and do the work that if we have a question and we want someone to answer it and we don't like their answer, we have to provide an answer as well, as opposed to, oh, I just don't like that. Well, no, you get to do the research on the position that you do like and let's sort this out rather than like, no, I don't like what you're saying. So I'm going to dismiss you. I'm like, don't do that. I think you put that very well. I think that's exactly right. I would want to underline it. If this were if this were written, I'd be bolding and underlining the, <laughs> the like previous like eight sentences you just said. Absolutely wonderful, wonderful. So okay, so um, great. So we re- resolved a, a few a few questions about other perceptions. Let's talk about sola scriptura real quick because I think that'll be some necessary foundation for the Westminster, so we can just get into it and work through it a little bit. So let's talk about. So one of the things that people don't understand is so outside of the reformed faith and probably sometimes even within it what is sola scriptura right because i run into this all the time so let's 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 talk about that yeah so sola scriptura is going to be the doctrine that in terms of when we think about how do you know anything uh that the that the the axiom the root of knowledge the the starting point of knowledge is what god has revealed in his word that he gives propositions that are certainty their foundation um, and so this idea that, that you have words from God that allow us to have knowledge and certainty. And so it's the only infallible, the only without error in terms of certainty that is without error mm-hmm. source that we can appeal to. So everything else, we go like, sin's experience. You know, can you ever have errors in your experience? You ever heard somebody call your name and then realize nobody called your name? You, know, you ever taste something and realize you didn't taste the thing? You smell a thing and you realize you didn't smell the thing? You, know, you have somebody touch, you think somebody just touched you and you go, nope, nobody touched me. Mm-hmm. Right? Th- those, those things, uh, this whole process of, of the touching, the smelling, the tasting, the seeing, and the hearing, uh, you know, I, I've seen water that wasn't there. I live in, you know, we live in Arizona. Mm-hmm. You, occasionally we see water that's not there. Um, you know, so th- those types of things where we, 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 our senses are not infallible. Um, and, and so our feelings, we don't, you know, if you feel like something's right or wrong, your feelings are not infallible. Um, and, and so, and this idea that you can't just from your own reason, you know, sitting in a Dutch oven, uh, you can't just figure out everything in the world and figure out the difference between right and wrong and, and uh, you know, the proper setting apart of, of, of truth from error that without some sort of word from God coming. Um, and, and that now reason is, is a part of that. So scripture is, Explicit words of Scripture, plus all of the good and necessary consequences. Mm -hmm. So that means it's what's said, and that includes all the stuff you could, by proper reasoning, get to. 
And there are, you know, you could get a good logic textbook from Gordon Clark or, or, or whatever and have, have that and read through the rules of that. And you can read about, you know, immediate inference and necessary inference uh, coming through syllogistic reasoning and, and learn those things. And there are rules for that. People think reasoning is not this objective form because nobody teaches logic anymore. Uh, mm-hmm. but, but, but logic is a very rigorous method, and it's in the Scriptures. The Scriptures themselves show us how to reason. Uh, you see Jesus doing it uh, with, the, with the Sadducees. You see the Scriptures throughout, but also you have this series of chains of reasoning in, in, in 1 Corinthians 15 where the Apostle Paul shows uh, you know, a, one syllogism followed by another in a chain that's called the Sorites. And so you, you have very rigorous reasoning laid out in the Scriptures itself showing us how to reason. Uh, so it's the explicit statements and the necessary inferences. Yeah, and a good example of a necessary inference is um, the scriptures reference Paul's mother-in-law. Did Paul's mother-in-law have a daughter? Yes, because that would have been Paul's wife, right? It doesn't explicitly say that she has a daughter, but you can reasonably infer that she's a daughter because it's Paul's mother-in-law, right? So we're allowed because right, you can't, you can't, you could not, you could not be, uh, you you could not, you could not be a mother-in-law without having a daughter, right? Absolutely. So definitionally, all mothers-in-law have daughters yes or or a son from a yes. boy <laughs> yes but like right. that's but, that, that's allowed yeah, yeah if right. you're married to a man yes that and that and and that's you're allowed to make those good and necessary inferences that draw out from the text truths that are still true right but that aren't as necessarily explicitly stated like where in scripture does it say jesus is god like that's a classic one from from muslims i think where does jesus say i am god like which he does he doesn't actually say that but if you you can draw from good and necessary inference from a number of different passages including you know a a lot of john um that this is jesus is god and the son of god right so that's that's part of that okay so so we we begin with the foundation of soul scripture so let's talk about let's now get to let's get to the westminster confession and what it is and perhaps where it came from and, and who put it together and then we'll just kind of work through it in a we don't i mean obviously it's a massive Massive document. I don't have to go through the whole thing, but just give people an overview of it um, so they can understand the structure, how to begin approaching it, and how to begin building it into their lives if they attend a church that is not a confessional church. Maybe the church is non denominational, or maybe they loosely hold to some confession of faith, or maybe they haven't even heard of confessions before. Just how to approach a, 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 heavy, a heavy tome like this. Sure. So you held up the little book before, if you wouldn't mind just holding it up again real quick. Yep. There's the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which is meant to be sort of the introductory thing. So first I would suggest somebody get that. Yep. And and so if you get the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Banner of Truth Trust. If you get, Right, absolutely. And you can get it for free online. Um, and I think uh, Puritan's Mind I think it's dot org or dot com mm-hmm. uh, has has a really great, you know, available free one with all the with all the links to all the proof texts and everything laid out there. Great. Um but you know that that document right there, that little shorter catechism, it's going to have in the first thirty-eight questions all of the essentials of the reformed gospel, right? The gospel according to the scriptures, and so it's going to have the solas, it's going to have tulip, it's going to have the doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine of the incarnation. You can have a really basic outline of the covenant structure of the Bible with you know Adam and the fall, and you're going to have Christ as the second Adam and how he saves us in the covenant of grace, and so. Uh, that that laid out in those first 38 questions. And then you're going to see in 39 um, through 81 the the law, the, the Ten Commandments. And you go, well, how do you, what what kind of life should the Christian live? And the Ten Commandments summarize that for us. And so you know, the law of God has three purposes, three uses. It's it's a mirror to show us our need of salvation. It's a chain to restrain evil. And it's a lamp unto our feet to show us the way of wisdom, the way we ought to live, the, the good life. Mm-hmm. And so the, the law is laid out there. Um, and then when you get through questions 82 to 107, it lays out what are called the ordinary means of grace. In other words, the ordinary means of, of being sanctified or growing in the Christian life. It's going to lay out, it's going to say, well, there's the Word of God, the Scriptures, you need to use them and, and sit under good preaching. There's the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. And there's prayer, and it's going to take the Lord's Prayer and break it down and explain it. And so that little thing, and then they say, you know, the other things that you should use is seek to understand what God commands in general and seek to apply those commands uh, as you learn them, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's it. That's the shorter catechism in summary. Mm-hmm. Um, and so those are those are the that's the milk. Those are the basics of the Christian life. Um, mm-hmm. And so I would I would kind of call that the um, 
you know, the essential elements of, of, of what it is to be a Christian. If there's the gospel. Here's the basic idea of, of, you know, you need to obey Jesus. And so he gives you the law there, and here's how you grow. Here's the, here, here's how, here's the milk you need to go be chasing down. Mm-hmm. Um, right? And so that's it. And that's what the Shorter Catechism lays out. And a lot of people would even look at that little booklet and say, well, that's a lot of stuff. I mean, a lot of churches' statements of faith are much shorter than that. Mm-hmm. And, and so I would say, what in that do you think is, is not necessary? Right, which which part of the first thirty eight questions of the gospel were you are you willing to just toss out, mm-hmm. um, and and what what are you what are you willing to do in terms of you know is it the nine commandments is it no you know are the ten commandments not a useful guide to help us to understand what what Eleven. our what our duties are, mm-hmm. um, and then and then you know which of the sacraments are you willing to throw out or is prayer not important or is the word of God not important to the Christian life right so it's like what what there is is worth throwing out so that's what I would say is a is the is a useful introduction for somebody who's really trying to get some of the, those basics down, and then as they go into the the Westminster Confession, I would say the confession, especially for somebody who's just starting out, the glorious thing is there's a table of contents at the front, and the table of contents is going to lay out the chapters from one to thirty three that are going to say for us here's an ordering of stuff that's from more basic systematically to less basic, and it's going to start with chapter one is is of the scriptures. And so you, you, it starts with, how do you know? Which is the most basic question, right? In, in philosophy, there are, there are three most basic questions and sort of a fourth one that follows after that has to do with, you know, enjoyment and, and, and joy. So the question is, the first one is, is how do you know or what's true? Mm-hmm. And that's, the, the study of that is called epistemology. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the Westminster standards start with the question of, of knowledge by starting with the scripture. And so the answer is what God has revealed is what we can know. And then the second one is, okay, well, what's, what's real? Chapter two, you get to God and the Holy Trinity. And so you end up with the nature of reality beginning with God and then his decrees, he chooses everything else that exists and he creates and he governs what he's created. So you have, you have God and then you have the decrees of God and then you have creation as decrees and you have providence as decrees. So providence is control of history. Mm-hmm. is control of of the stuff that he's made. And so um, you you have this laying out, and what are the major parts of, of what happens in, in history? What's in terms of reality? You have the fall, and you have salvation by a redeemer, and you have all the ways in which that salvation works itself out in the lives of individuals and in the course of history in the church. And so there's this huge middle section explaining reality to us, explaining God, explaining the creation, explaining the, the history that occurs with that creation and explaining salvation and how the curse is dealt with in terms of the work to, to renew and reform and to recreate. And so that, that whole thing about how reality works there in the middle chunk, and it gets to the issue of the law of God and good works and, and, you, and you see the question, the third big question, right? The, the first big question in philosophy, how do you know? Second big question, what's real? Third big question is this idea of, I think, I think by throwing up my thumb, I somehow like made some emblem show up. I don't know. That was kind of cool. I don't know what that was, but yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I did, but if I can figure it out, I can reproduce it. I don't um, either, but anyway, go ahead. So, so, so then, um, so then, <laughs> see if we can get you to do it. No. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, so then you have the third big question, which is what's good, right? So mm-hmm. what's true, what's real, what's good? And so the question of ethics, right? Uh, and and if, how do you different? How do you know what is the the good to be sought after, um, and how do you know uh, how to get it? Right. So the definition of good and the, the means to the good. And so we have you know the law of God and the definition of good works, and we have Christian liberty that you know, we don't get. You know, people can't impose on us all this stuff that's that's made up. But instead, we are free to pursue what's good in terms of what God has revealed in His law. And so you've got all this stuff laid out, like like covenanting, which the good life is rooted in focusing on covenanted institutions, you know, covenant with God um, that occurs uh, historically with our forebearers, but also this idea of, of in baptism, you're, you're in covenant, and in the Lord's Supper, you renew covenant. Um, and then you have this idea of, of, you know, the household, which is established by the covenant of marriage, and how children are, are, are you know, a part of the covenant institution. Um, you deal with the church as a covenant institution and the good life being there, which means it's not just this voluntary thing that people should, you know, go in and out of like a social club. Mm-hmm. And and then the state, 
And so these are all discussed there. And these are the big parts of life. And everybody's asking these questions, and we're all going like, oh, how are we going to solve these problems? There are so many Christians that have thought about this before mm -hmm. and who have tried to organize thoughts, and we're all acting like we have to figure it out anew as opposed to going, the Bible answers these questions, and Christians have organized the information from the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so then you've got the issue of, of how things work out in that life, and then ultimately where is history going with the last judgment um, and, and with the return of Christ and the resurrection um, and, and so forth, and the end of our own lives as well, this idea of like where do we, you know, what happens to us after we die. But those are laid out for us in the confession. And so so that, that, that fourth question of philosophy that I was going to mention is you know, sort of the question of, of aesthetics, mm. which is you know, what's beautiful? Mm. Um, and and the scriptures the scriptures provide us you know the, 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 the Westminster Confession provides us with an answer that the scriptures are how we know it's true they, they they show us what's real they show us what's good and they show us the beauty of this good life and how the beauty of this good life is what's fitting to man and to God and how as we seek to live out more and more and be renewed after the image of Christ and live out and bear fruit according to this, that it manifests beauty, that there's this glorious beauty in that life. And so I think the, 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 the Westminster Confession uh, has this wonderful systematic laying out of these doctrines from the more basic ones to the less basic ones, um, and that's, that's what I would say. See, now it's my turn to bold and underline everything that you just said. <laughs> that's awesome. In fact, even hearing about it, 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 I'm a little incredulous, like, how can such a thing exist? especially knowing, and I listen to a lot of sermons and, and, and write a lot of content about Christianity, and to, there's, there seems to be very little indication that a document of the sort that you just described would exist, given what the kind of things that people are talking about. And yet, here it is. And, and one thing I want to point out that makes the Westminster Confession different from, say, the Catholic Catechism is every single statement, um, every, single, uh, every single answer to all of the questions, for example, just in the Shorter Catechism, exclusively exclusively refers to Scripture as the authority, right? So I'll just yes. have question 41. Wherein is the moral law summarily comprehended? Answer, the moral law is summarily comprehended in the Ten Commandments. And then there's a little, there's a little note about Deuteronomy 10.4 as supporting that answer versus the Catholic Catechism, which would provide something similar and would either refer to Scripture or the previous ruling of a council. Mean the councils or the, or the logic, the logic of men. The Westminster Confession appeals exclusively to the Word of God, no other and no other source, and that's the manifestation of sola scriptura, so that you can know that it's not by, as you said, uh, uh, Pastor David, it's it's not you know human reason or sense experience or memory. It's it's solely it's solely the unbreakable Word of God, and that's how you that's how you know that the answers are true, or that's how you know that the information from Scripture has been compiled and systematized in a way that helps us live a life aligned towards the true, the real, the good, and the beautiful. And, and that's, that is the Christian faith. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to it. Absolutely. And, and I think one of the neat things, your chapter 31 of the, of the Confession is of synods and councils, and it talks about how oh. they can err and how they need to be judged by Scripture. Mm -hmm. Chapter 1 on Scripture itself also talks about how we have to judge councils by the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And so the Westminster Assembly, when, it's, when it starts... It's chapter on Scripture, chapter 1. It's saying, hey, judge what we're writing here by the Scripture. Mm -hmm. And then when you get to talking about the subject matter of synods and councils, they say all of synods and councils can err, and many have erred, and you need yeah. to judge us by the Scripture. Right? So it's like there's this huge emphasis on the idea that, that Scripture is the authority. Search the Scriptures to see if what we're saying is so. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's, how you, and that's how you know that it's true, right? Because I, I think one of the things that all the denominations agree all the faithful denominations agree is that the bible is the infallible word of god there is there is no faithful denomination that teaches yeah maybe like they agree on that right and so if you agree on that then you would know that that is the place that you can turn to for sure that is true right absolutely you, and that's and that's a really that's a really really important that's a really important distinction so um so one of the things that that um well, let's talk about how this came this came together because you, you mentioned that it's a I'm not sure the word you use whether it's a, a compilation or, or of 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 previously acquired truth system systematization like what what were the circumstances that brought this particular document together and and who was responsible for it? Sure. So to you know from a Protestant perspective with church history 
the, the, the way you're going to look at history, you're going to say, okay, so we had the completion of the apostolic era and the completion of the scriptures by 70 AD. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then from that point forward, you're going to say, there's this, you know, at the end of the apostolic era, um, as the apostles had been killed off and, and variously died, um, you know, John dying naturally, the rest of them seeming to have been murdered. Yeah. Um, what you have is sort of this period where there's a significant decline that occurs quickly thereafter, and there's all sorts of heresy that, that is being dealt with. And one of the early major heresies being you know, Arianism, which is the idea that Jesus is created as opposed to God. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you you have the Nicene Council trying to capture uh, information about the doctrine of the Trinity. A century later, you deal with the Chalcedonian Creed, uh, which is this effort to capture the doctrine of the Incarnation. So you have you have the Trinity, and then you have the Incarnation, um, and you're kind of working through things. And then by the time you you get to the sixth century, you have this issue of of the nature of man, um, and you also have the issue of salvation by grace and not by man's nature being emphasized a lot. And Orange sort of council, the Council of Orange seems to gather together issues there pretty well. But those are examples, and by the, by the time you get to the six hundreds, you have the rise of the papacy and this pretty dramatic starting to claim infallibility. There's this interesting, embarrassing event that occurred at Chalcedon where the, the the legates of Rome appear at Chalcedon and they say, you know, we all agreed that Rome is higher than everybody else. Um, and the, the council at Chalcedon says, uh, no, we didn't. That's not in the original documents. You guys just like made this up. Um, and then the, the council literally also votes to say that new Rome, uh, in other words, Constantinople, would be viewed as equal with Rome. Um, and so they not only deny the history of, of the claim of the papacy at the Council of Chalcedon, but they even explicitly say that the bishop of, of Constantinople is to be viewed as equal to the bishop of, of Rome, uh, which, you know, that's already a development of, of corruption where you have the patriarchates and stuff like that, which is a process of the accumulation of power uh, that's, that's unbiblical. But but it just there's these interesting sort of things that are happening. Even even as they're dealing with these doctrinal things, there's there's all sorts of other issues coming up, and you end up with sort of this this centralizing of power in Western Europe into into the Roman bishop, uh, and the papacy ends up trying to suppress all sorts of of biblical teaching uh, throughout Europe, and it, it becomes more and more powerful, and that really occurs from from Gregory the Great, the Great air quotes. Um, and you, you end up with sort of this significant centralization. And there's all sorts of people who are called forerunners of the Reformation and, and, and stuff like that. But the reality is there's always been biblical Christianity. It's always existed, um, and it has never been lost. Uh, but what we find is that in the, the zones that were dominated by papal power, um, that there was a, an event occurred in the 1400s where the Muslims took over Constantinople. Um, and the result was that you had all of these documents that were being moved from Eastern Europe to Western Europe, including Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. And as these Greek manuscripts of the New Testament flood into Western Europe and start to go into print and be dealt with, um, there's this, this sort of unleashing of the Word of God more broadly uh, to make it more broadly available. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Reformation uh, you know, begins in that context. Um, and you have all sorts of, again, the forerunners of the Reformation, but I'm not going to go through all that. But in the beginning of it... Well, I would like to Mar- talk about that at some point, but please continue this part. Sure. And, and so so when you when you have sort of Zwingli and Luther, and you have sort of the, the remnants of you know the Lollards and the Hussites and all that, and, and, and the Waldenses and all these various groups that are sort of going, Bible, the Bible is the Word of God, and there's this significant effort to say, we need to not have the traditions of men... Um, or the or human inventions control us, mm-hmm. but to see um, individuals, households, the church, and the state be dominated and controlled by the Word of God, mm-hmm. and to see Christ as the king over all those things. And so Reformation period from about 1517 until 1648, which is sort of this really interesting culminating period where you know the, the English Civil War, the, the Scots resistance against the tyrannical imposition of bishops and the Book of Common Prayer, the the Thirty Years' War, where uh, you know, where the Romanists were seeking to you know basically st- exterminate uh, the Protestants, the uh, Dutch War of Independence, which is called the Eighty Years' War, these all come to an end. Like this, this like stops in 1648, and so you have what's called the Peace of Westphalia, um, and this sort of 
this sort of ending of the religious wars of extermination. And uh, we often think of it kind of as just coming to an end and, and this being this war you know, between mean Protestants and mean Catholics that are all killing each other. But these wars were essentially over and over again just wars of Rome trying to exterminate Protestants. And they succeeded in Spain. They succeeded, they succeeded in most of Italy. They succeeded in Poland. They succeeded to a large extent in France. Um, and, and a third of the population of Germany dies during this, uh, during this, you know, the Thirty Years' War, and this is all an effort to stop Protestantism. Mm. And and so we look at the great upheaval of the religious wars that occur in this period. But 1517 to 1648, that chunk of time is sort of viewed as the Reformation era. Um, and what happens is a victory of the Protestants to be able to have their separate domains. Mm. And the goal of the Protestants was not to control Rome. The goal right. of the Protestants was to be able to live and to have Christian spheres. And so I think oftentimes you talk about conflict before. Mm. You know, this people, people oftentimes don't go into conflict enough because they want to feel safe in a bunch of spheres everywhere. And what we need to remember is that historically, the concern is to make Christian space where Christianity thrives and then to project out from there. Mm. And so... The context of this is people making spaces that are able to be um, Christian spaces, uh, where they're able to be Christian and to not be oppressed and to be able to carry out the, the law of God, and that's what true Christian liberty is. And so this effort in that period of time was to write Christian confessions, to see churches put into good order, to have unity, and for them to to covenant together to maintain the doctrine, to share forms of worship that are according to Scripture alone, and to see church government ordered according to Scripture alone. Mm-hmm. So they would adopt these documents that were confessions of faith, directories of worship, and forms of government. Mm-hmm. And they would seek to see this established so that the civil magistrate would acknowledge the true religion and help to see the church properly equipped to be put into order, and then generally to then seek to see this church to maintain itself from there. So that process of establishing and endowing um, is sort of the how you go out of the chaos. And you see that with the Reformations in Israel or Judah um, during the Old Testament, the idea of like this kind of imposition where the, the, the magistrate comes in and seeks to stop some of the chaos and help to see the church established and endowed. But that that occurs, and so the, there's this covenanting. So you see, you see a covenanting in the church and in the state to seek to honor the Lord and to seek to, to see the truth um, be taught, right worship done, and and to have justice administered in terms of church government and also in the state. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's separate institutions, separate, both under the Word of God, both reformed. Christ is the King of Kings over states, and He is the King of the Church. Mm-hmm. And so you you acknowledge that, and you have the separate institutions. Now, that's the broader context. And in the Reformation, you had all this work to seek to organize the work that had come before especially the stuff before sort of this, the, the, the rise of the papal dominion. Um, and so you see kind of this return and an organizing of it, and you have things like the Belgic Confession, you have the Heidelberg Catechism, you have uh, the Synod of Dort dealing with the Arminian controversy. Mm-hmm. And so all that work is done, and you have this arrival in, in, the, in the 1640s when the Church of England was seeking to start to kind of move in a in a direction where they were having inventions of human doctrine and worship, and they were seeking to impose it on the people. Um, and so the Puritans were opposing that. Um, and in, in Scotland, there was a Presbyterian church, there was a Reformed church that was established, and there had been a union of Scotland and England so that the king of one was the king of both. So Charles I seeks to impose what's called the Book of Common Prayer, which is essentially a directory of worship, um, onto Scotland and also to impose a form of government that's not in the scriptures called Episcopalianism, which is where bishops govern men, um, as opposed to having the idea of, of elected elders that are bishops that sit in councils um, and that you know are, are, are responsible and able to be removed and, and, and dealt with. This, I, this idea of the imposition of Episcopalianism, of the directory of, of worship that was the Book of Common Prayer, and also, to some extent, Arminian doctrine coming in. The result was the Scots waged war to be able to preserve their ability to maintain their church and their religion. Mm. And the, the practices this comes down to 
And there's a call, it's called the Bishop's War. The first Bishop's War and the second Bishop's War initiate that. And so the, the practice has come down to, in the Book of Common Prayer, Charles was trying to force them to have their, their, their ministers wear a, a uniform mm-hmm. to use a sign of the cross in baptism and uh, to kneel at the Lord's table as opposed to sitting at a table. Mm-hmm. And they thought that this was so important because they were so clear in Scripture that these were not things that they should be required to do, that they were willing to fight over these details and wage war. This is the level of zeal that they had. Wow. Wow. And they also to not have bishops and to instead be able to retain a Presbyterian government. Okay, that's important. <laughs> yes. But, yeah. but yeah, so, so, so <laughs> that, that process, the, the, the first war is a defensive war. And they win, and the king tries to assemble an army to try to go invade Scotland again. Uh-huh. And and at this time, the pure and he has to call a parliament together to get to raise taxes because there are limits in Britain because of the history of Christian government there with the Magna Carta and so forth. Uh-huh. That he can't just raise taxes to whatever he wants; he has to get a parliament to approve. Uh-huh. Well, the parliament gets elected, and it's filled with Presbyterian Puritans, so they are unwilling to raise taxes to go impose the Book of Common Prayer on Presbyterian Puritans in Scotland. <laughs> One flaw in my plan. <laughs> oh, so close. <laughs> so, so then, so then they go. We actually, you know, we're going to resist you if you won't stop. Is eventually what happens, and and so then that starts the English Civil War. Is the Parliamentary Presbyterian Puritans fighting against King Charles as an Episcopalian, and he's trying to impose this 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 worship on Scotland. So yeah. they win. The Scots working together with the Puritan Parliament, they win, huh. and 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 in the process, there during this, the Scots basically said, the only way we're going to work with you to seek to continue to resist the king, not just in Scotland, but to come down and help you in England, is if you will covenant with us to see that we have a shared confession, directory of worship, and form of government. Okay, and so. That that was that was that was called um, uh, so that was called the Solemn League and Covenant, okay. and so that forms this this agreement this covenant with with Britain uh, as a whole as opposed to just Scotland. And so you have you have Britain and and Ireland being brought into that. So that's the context for this, and the, the Westminster Assembly is called for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, to, to, to deal with the, the confession of faith, the directory of worship, and this idea of having a shared form of government. And so they, they write these documents in that context in order to gather together that work and to do that in the English-speaking world together. And so okay. this is the last great effort. And it's a, so it's, an, it's a multinational, it's an international synod that involves Wales, England, Scotland, Ireland. And you have the Scots participating in this assembly— and the the basically the moderator of it is 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 a, is is a Scot, and you have his name is William Twist, and so you have this this significant interaction there to seek to have a reformed faith that they're covenanted to uphold in Britain, and so that's the context where this gets brought up, and they are putting that together to try to gather that, and they have all the benefit of all the work that had happened in the Reformation before, and their goal was to be in uh, in unity with the Reformed churches on the continent as well, to be mm. able to, to be in agreement. So that's their goal. Their goal was to see that advanced. And so they're going from what are called the 39 Articles of the Church of England to this. And so this was an effort to reform and to become more clearly biblical in that direction. That's, and that's where that happens. So they kind of obtained victory by 1648, um, and there's a lot of stuff that happens after that. But that's that's the context for all Couple that things. That's, no, that's, incre- that, that's incredibly helpful because, you know, obviously— uh, what's what's the joke that people make? I think it's James White makes the joke that um, for a lot of evangelicals today, church history begins with Billy Graham, right? Um, now, I don't personally have that experience, obviously, but you know, because I came along a little bit after that. But I can see how people believe that. And so then, once you start talking about church history, then you start getting into territory that a lot of Roman Catholics and a lot of Eastern Orthodox seem to have a better grasp on, though they have their own perspective on it. And part of that perspective is that the Protestant Reformation was the introduction of evil onto the earth. Seems to be. It was all it was all great before then, and then Martin Luther came along, and then evil arrived on the earth. That seems to be how the they true frame fall. It. The true fall. The true fall. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Um, but to understand that, like, well, first of all, that's not the case, and second of all, that there is a 
Protestant church history in a manner of speaking, that there mm-hmm. were people fighting. I think it was, I learned this from you, like the Hussites and you know who were fighting for biblical doctrine. And just what an enormous controversy it was that the Bible could be printed in the common tongue, that it could be available for people, just how much that was trying to be stamped out. And then the controversy that arose as people tried to figure out you know, how to bring the doctrine together and what a, a solidifying moment the Westminster Confession of Faith was. So let's bring together 1600, you know, 600, 1,600 or so years of doctrine, teaching, confessions, learned men, you know, thought about Scripture and put it together in one concise form, again, as you said, to, to document the true, the real, the good, and the beautiful. And, and then that's, and understandably so, that's why it's the high watermark of the Reformation. It's all these years, centuries of learning brought together in something that like you can read and that exists. But right. so many churches don't hold to either the Westminster Confession or the London Baptist, which I guess have they have a significant amount in common. They differ in some really significant ways, but they have a lot in common. But so mm-hmm. many churches don't, they aren't confessional. They don't even reference or teach on these confessions. Given that they're out there, why don't they? Yeah, and I think, you know, if so you mentioned, for example, the 1689 London Baptist Confession, which is literally you know, Westminster with the alteration on elements related to church government and baptism. Mm-hmm. That's it, right? That's, yep. that's, the, that's the effort there. There's the Savoy Declaration, which is the Congregationalist version, which is just changing the form of government, right? And so like, there, was, there was so much agreement um, in, in the Reformed world about these that you have literally the Presbyterian, Congregationalist, and Baptist confession all being the same except for, again, church government, Right. or the baptism issue there. And so you have these, the reason these are not dealt with is because there's been such a widespread declension because people don't want to deal with it. They don't want to be accountable for it. They don't want to have to argue against the details of it. Um, they don't want to have to have to deal with the systematic theology. And frankly, I think the pastors of our land are, are very ignorant about the Bible and very ignorant about church history. Um, and, and I think that, that there's, I would assert that pastors who don't have the solas, tulip, trinity, the incarnation, and a really basic understanding, at least, of the idea of Adam as a federal head and Christ as the second Adam, if they don't get those things, then these guys are not men that should be pastors, period. Um and, and if, they, if you have heard of these things, studied these things, and you're denying them, you're a heretic. And so the denial of those things, the solas, tulip, again, the trinity, the incarnation, a basic understanding of Adam and Christ in terms of federal heads, if you don't understand those things or you understand them and you've then rejected them, you're a heretic, and if you don't understand them, you are so ignorant that it is embarrassing that you're a pastor. What you need to do is to recognize that you're not fit there, and you either need to go study in a real hurry and figure out if you can somehow help your church to reform, or or you need to be resigning from the pastorate and seeking to learn under a solid pastor. Mm-hmm. Um, so that reality, right? We we have we have seen heresy explode in our land, and that has occurred in a long process. But the churches have failed to discipline heretics. The churches have failed to deal with it. Discipline, you talked about conflict. Conflict's a huge part of here. If we won't discipline heretics for teaching heresy publicly, and we don't have a way of checking them, and holding them accountable, then they will flourish. And then when they gain power, they hunt and remove the men that are more solid. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's one thing. The other thing is, in the state, the American kind of the American compromise that we reached, where um, in you know the declaration, sorry, in the Constitution, where we made it so that the federal government would not have an established religion, but the state governments would, led into the state governments not, and into us just kind of believing that that we should just allow every type of blasphemy, heresy, witchcraft, and whatever else to just run wild. Yeah. And so that being the case, with no civil magistrate to restrain these things, but instead the civil magistrate defending these things. Uh, those things can become protected. And when the churches don't have process for discipline being dealt with and don't have a way of dealing with public heresy, um, 
then what you have is the church not maintaining and protecting doctrine. You have idolatry that begins to spread as well throughout the church, which is all sorts of human inventions and you know, seeker-sensitive worship that's designed to appeal to men's feelings and emotions as opposed to what is it that God has instituted in his word and what's, what's pleasing to him. Mm-hmm. And so these things sort of manifest out and explode. So what you're going to see is you're going to see, uh, if there's Reformation, you're going to see a bunch of people that are gathering to to separate out from those things and seek to make more carefully guarded places where the doctrine, worship, and government is properly maintained. Um, and so that's that's the way that gets that, that gets guarded, that it's, it's reestablished, and that's why we got here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, generally, like um, failing to punish heretics. This is again brings us back to J. Gresham Machen. That's what he's talking about a hundred years ago in that book. Is the it's at that point it's not even a slow creep of liberalized doctrine. At that point, it's I mean you can read the book. Anyone can read the book and see the picture that he's describing of liberalism in the church. It, he might as well be describing today, right? And by then it was already it was already widespread, right? And, and I love what you said about you know tulip and the solas and that you know, a lot of peace, pastors don't agree with that. They they do not they do not agree with that. And we're, and I think we're talking well. I, are we talking about something more than Calvinism versus Arminianism, or, is, or would you consider that an expression of it as well? Yeah, so I, mean, I, I think Calvinism versus Arminianism. I think Arminianism is another gospel. Um, you know, if, if you if you if you say that man is not totally depraved, and you're saying that there's goodness in man, that whereby man can can do the act that brings about salvation, you're giving salvific power to man and himself. Uh, if you're saying that God is not the decider. Of of who is who is going to be saved ultimately, and he didn't decide from eternity past, um, you know, of his own mere pleasure, uh, what he wanted to do, but instead that he had to look and see what men did, and he was dependent upon their choices. There, then you're removing the divinity from God. Uh, you, you limited atonement. If Christ died for everybody, then he's unjust to punish the people that have been paid for, right? And you, you now make it so that there's something else besides the death of Christ that makes it so that the justice issue is dealt with. Irresistible grace, can you, can you, you know, resist God's power to save you? If he, if he, <laughs> this idea that you are capable of stopping God from accomplishing his will, that makes you God or makes him not. Mm-hmm. And, and if, you, if, there's, if there's no perseverance of the saints, then we have the work that God does to save a man being ineffectual, and some of the people he saves, he ends up losing, uh, which mm-hmm. breaks the promises. I mean, these are, these are, these are not tertiary points. This mm-hmm. is of the essence of the gospel. Uh, and that was the point of the Synod of Dort, to capture the points. As their, you know, The Arminians brought their five points, the remonstrance. They brought their, their protests against the Reformed religion. Those are the five points they, they protested against. And the five points of Calvinism are their response. And that, that's right. that, res- and that, and that response is an effort to say, the denial of these things is heresy. These positions must be maintained. And so many people that call themselves Reformed now are, are not willing to call Arminianism heresy. Well, I'll tell you what, if you allow Arminianism to go on in your church being not opposed and you're not willing to discipline it, um, you're not going to maintain that church as a gospel-preaching church for long. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to find it overwhelmed uh, at some point. I mean, Charles Spurgeon was a Calvinist. He, when he died, very quickly his church became Arminian. No oh, wow. And, it's because he didn't maintain a line of discipline there where he would differentiate. And so I love Charles Spurgeon. He said lots of great things. I think he accomplished a lot of great things. But all of that work to institutionalize, you know, and now it's just been handed over to people that were denying the gospel he preached. He over and over again taught the gospel of free grace and taught that Calvinism is the true gospel. And then to lose the church that he himself led to that so quickly, we, we, we act like we're all just preparing for the rapture. Right? We act like mm. we're all just preparing to be helicoptered out. And the reality is we have to build. And the way you build things and have it last is you disciple people according to a shared standard of doctrine. And if we're trying to build for longer than five minutes from now, we have to have a lot of agreement. Um, and so you need to disciple your children. You need to disciple in your homes. You need to see churches where officers are raised up and trained to hold to a covenanted standard and you need to hold the line on those things. Um, and, and everybody wants to just grow a mega church mega fast and make mega bucks. And the reality is that that is not what we're called to, which is why I didn't seek to go figure out how to grow a mega church in order to make mega dollars. I thought, I'm going to work 
and I'm going to make money doing other stuff, and I'm just going to seek to be as faithful as I can be. And and I you know I'm willing to make tents, and I'm willing to try to gather resources so that I don't have to rely upon pulling enough money together uh, to support myself in that. And I think we 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 treat the pastorate like it's a it's a job, and you're not allowed to do any other work. Um, and more and more, a lot of reformed and faithful pastors are bivocational mm-hmm. uh, because. They have to make money doing something else so that they can see right doctrine taught and right worship administered um, and to see church discipline maintained. Mm-hmm. And I think the Lord's going to bless that. I think we're going to find these churches from guys that are, that are doing this um, are going to be things that are far more stable, um, and there's going to be a lot more willingness to hold the line by guys who are not dependent um, entirely for that sake. So yeah, there's a lot to say there, but just I'll leave it there. No, that's that's. I, I think you're. I think you're absolutely right. I think... Um... One of the things that was apparent to me even during COVID, which was um, which was in a period of time before um, I had even gotten baptized or even started thinking about any of these issues, it was apparent to me, or maybe I had gotten baptized, but I was aware and I was looking for a church to attend. This is like fall, early winter, twenty twenty. So like October, November, December, January in that time frame. It's like okay, well, I'm Christian now, I better start going to church. Like oh, they're all closed. Okay, that. I don't know why that is. You'd think that they would, you know, Jesus went down with the, you know, Romans and the Pharisees. Like there was, okay. So I kind of had gotten the sense that there was a, a, a crisis happening within the church that um, there were pastors that maybe they had taken like 501c3 status and, you know, you don't want to lose that. You don't want to lose that tax exempt status. That's how they get you. And then once you have um, people tithing, you know, and your salary and your livelihood is dependent on the church, you don't want to offend people. And some people are getting super worked up. And so they're getting their, you know, chain tugged like, oh, we better stay closed because we don't want to upset people. And suddenly, even back then, it was apparent to me that the whole word of God wasn't being preached to people because I had never associated Christianity with capitulating to government power. I didn't know much about Christianity, but I knew that that was not what it was about, right? I knew that much. And so you saw during that time, and I saw during that time, all that happening everywhere. I couldn't find a church that was open, right? And the one church that I did find that was open, that at least had a, at least they said something legitimate, like, look, we're not here to sort through. They posted a statement on their website, and this is in Central Phoenix, and they said, look, we hear both sides of the argument. It says this on the on the website. What we hear both sides of the argument and we're not here to, to litigate that, right? So so we're going to go with what the government says. Like, okay, at least they were transparent about their process. I appreciated that. They opened back up and still everyone's wearing masks, right? And I did not wear a mask in the church. Like, why are you all wearing masks, right? But it was a real sign of when the when push came to shove, when things got difficult, where did the pastors land? Not on God's word. They landed on the word of Fauci or the word of, you know, their parishioners, as opposed to what does is, what is the word say? And that's what I appreciate about Apologia is that they stayed open the entire time and churches that stayed open during that time in defiance, you know, not necessarily for the purpose of defiance. Like right. We're not staying open specifically because we want to be, uh, because we want to be defiant, because this is what the word says. Those churches have flourished in many ways as yes. it, as it should. And, and I think, um, you know, the pastors of Apologia have a history of being brave for the Word of God, mm-hmm. um, but also of of being desirous, uh, you know, to not just pick fights for no reason. I know I've uh, interacted, you know, multiple times with the pastors there, where they're they're saying, you know, we're willing to bear this burden, even though it's a violation of our rights, because we're trying to avoid creating unnecessary trouble, whatever. So they understand that there are rights they're willing to give up and bear problems on, but. They also know that they don't have to give up their rights, and they also know there's times where it would be sin to give up their rights. Yep. Um, and so for them to pick fights on that. And so I think um, you know the, the, the courage of the pastors there has, has been on display in efforts, for example, to seek to, um, you know, to, to save the unborn from the oppression that's occurred um, with you know, just us legalizing the murder of the unborn. Their, their work there, um, their work to communicate bravely the gospel on the streets and um, and to again resist that you know closure uh, type of forced closure behavior, I think those are examples of that. And so I would encourage other pastors to look to that. Um, I think that pastors of Apologia um, are, are heroes uh, in the sense of being brave men who have been willing to put themselves at risk for for significant sacrifices for the cause of God and truth. Um, and so I I want to commend them for that and encourage others to look to that example. 
Amen. Amen. Do you have a few more minutes for a couple more questions? I know you've got family and businesses and all that, so I don't want to keep you too long. I do. I'm good. Okay, cool. So um, you touched on it a little bit. Let's talk about post-millennialism because, you know, uh, perhaps you've seen in the news recently, the discussion of the red heifer, you know, right? And I have a lot of, uh, a lot of my mutuals on Twitter, you know, getting very worked up that this might be the end times. I do not agree with them at all. And I, I think post-millennialism is a is a far better place to land, but let's talk about why it's a more scriptural place to land and particularly what it means in the lives of everyday men and women as believers. Yeah. So I think, you know, when we, when we look at the, when we look at the scriptures, uh, one of the things to consider here is, you know, what is the millennium? Um, right. And, and the millennium is the period of time. It's the thousand years where Christ is reigning. And you got to ask yourself, what is, what is this reign? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's associated with the new covenant and there's all these promises with the with the new covenant and the renewing of the heavens and the earth, um, and and so you go, okay, where's all the, what, what is all this? And you look at the prophets in the Old Testament, and you go, there's all these promises of, of great stuff happening. You read Isaiah, and it talks about this time where people who die at a hundred are going to be considered babes, <laughs> a time when you're going to have newborn babies um, that uh, you know when they're still quite young, uh, playing with serpents um, and not being bit by them, um, lions uh, being present with you know animals that are normally their prey, that they're not eating them. Um, and this is all in this context of this idea of a world where there's still people dying and where there's still people being born. Um, and so you know what you find is that popular Christianity in America, uh, you know, evangelicalism broadly, is going to say, Okay, well, the millennium is the time after Jesus comes. So Jesus is going to come back. There's going to be the resurrection and all that, or there's going to be the day of judgment, and then there's going to be this millennial reign where, where he's come. Well, the, the problem there is you don't have people dying anymore, and you don't have people being born anymore after mm-hmm. Jesus comes back. So we can't really make that work. Um, and, and, and so, okay, so, so, the, so that, that, that can't work. Uh, for this period of, of time after Jesus returns, where there's the resurrection and when he judges people, you can't have more people dying and then this births. Okay, so that makes it so that we're going to have to deal with this idea of what is where is the millennium? Where does it, where does it fit? Um, and what we find is we have the reality that Christ is resurrected and he's ascended, and he's now at the right hand of the Father, and so he is on the throne, and his rain is occurring there. Okay, so okay, so we're in the millennium. So that leaves us with like amillennialism, which says the millennium is now, but it never really gets that amazing. Uh, or, or you have postmillennialism, which can say that the millennium is now and it's going to get really amazing. Or they might, you know, there's some form of postmillennialism that's going to say the millennium is in the future and then it's going to be really amazing. But that's sort of, uh, there's, there's a number of problems with that. Like, for example, again, that ends up denying that Christ is, is ascended on the throne now, and that the, the reign is now. Mm. So if he's ascended and he's reigning at the right hand of the Father, that sounds like his reign. And so this millennium seems to be occurring now, and the promises of these good things of the new covenant and the good things of that reign um, have to occur in that reign. And so you, you go to things like you know Psalm 110 that says, you know, He's going to reign until he puts all of his enemies under his feet. Okay. You go to uh, Psalm 20, 23. It says he's going to prepare a table before us. He does prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Mm-hmm. And so he cares for us. Psalm 47 says that he's going to subdue our enemies on his enemies under our feet. Okay. So he subdues them under his feet, but we're his body. The church is his body. And he subdues them under our feet, which is his feet. And so this idea that he's doing that, he's, he's through the church subduing these enemies, and he's doing it through the gospel advancing. And so he is the king of the church, he's reigning, and he subdues all of his and our enemies. He, is, you know, he has crushed the head of the serpent, he has defeated Satan, he's bound him, he's undeceiving the nations, the world is being converted and being turned into the church, and you have flesh being subdued and the Holy Spirit you know, empowering and and causing us more and more to obey the Lord. And so you look at all of that, and you go to 1 Corinthians 15, and it says he must reign until he subdued these enemies. And it says, and the last enemy he's going to subdue is death. Mm-hmm. 
which means that we're going to see this subduing work done of everything else, and then the general resurrection occurs, and that's when the last enemy is overcome, because death is overcome by the resurrection. And so we're in this, this, we have all these things here that lay this out. It is necessary scripturally that we're, that we're in the millennium, that we're in the period of time where Christ is reigning as king, and it's necessary that before he comes back and has the general resurrection, that he's going to subdue these enemies, and he's going to do it through the church. And so that makes you, so you realize the church militant is going to win. Right? The church militant is on the move. The church militant is conquering the world. The Lord Jesus Christ's kingdom is advancing. It's grinding to dust all the empires of the earth. This, this rock comes and shatters the image of the empires, and then it grows to fill the earth. It's 11 that's going to fill the whole lump. It's a wheat field, not a tear field, mm-hmm. right? So that being the case, you have all that stuff, and you go, we're going to win. <laughs> and so when you realize that we're going to win, you kind of start to go, I mean, should I, should I join the fight? Should I, should I try to do some things? Like, should we, should we build things that help to, like, move this along? Like, should we do the mop-up operation faster? Uh, if we're going to do this, we, we have to have plans to win. And, and so that being the case, you also start to look around and you go, things are still pretty bad. Mm. And if things are still pretty bad, there's probably a lot of work left to do. Mm-hmm. And so if there's a lot of work left to do, then what we need to do is we need to make long-term plans as opposed to like shoddy short-term plans. Mm-hmm. And so when you're just like, our goal is to just go out there and get a bunch of converts and not disciple them, but to just make them make more converts, and we're just going to focus on a really shallow sort of discipleship, you kind of like barely get any sort of depth. And they're ineffectual to a large extent, but it changes the way you do things. As opposed to if you go, the promise is that we're going to fill the earth with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. It's broad, it's everywhere, and it's deep. And so the way you disciple and the way that you focus on church and the way that you focus on the Christian life, when you go, this is a long-term process, we're going to win. And I need to make the most of what I've got and I need to realize that I have an order of operation, and I have orders of responsibility, an order of love. I need to go from the closer in to the further out. I need to get in better order. I need to get the more basic in order before I get the less basic in order. You all of a sudden go, okay, this is a very different game. And, and so when we take the law of God and we go, our goal is to understand the law of God and apply it in detail in all of the spheres that we have and to disciple people to be able to do that so that I can delegate stuff out and all that. That process is, is, a, is a life where you're going to find far more fruit and you're going to find little spheres of Christian influence that are far more deeply Christian and you're going to see those kind of spill over and f- overflow. And, and that's how we see Reformation. And that's how we're going to see things happen. And you don't run around constantly crying that the sky is falling. Mm-hmm. And, and you don't, you're not just constantly worried about you know, whatever doomsday thing that's coming up. You just kind of go, huh, yeah, whatever, and you move on, mm-hmm. right? So, like, I'm not bothered. Like, I don't even care about the news, except right. insofar as it affects, like, business or some immediate impending danger of something i got to deal with with people that, that I've got a duty to care for or protect. Mm-hmm. And so I get to just focus on doing work and teaching people the good news as opposed to, like, the random news that popped up on whatever headline that I'm not even sure is true. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I tune out most of the news today for precisely that reason. Like, eyes on target, guys. Like we have, we have work to do, right? As you're, as you're telling, as you're telling that story, as you're, as you're putting together the pictures of, of post-millennialism in this compelling way that I really hope reaches the, reaches the hearts of, of men listening. Like there's, there's work to do. We're not going to be helicoptered out. Right. And like, right. even if we are, we should probably be building to protect our loved ones now anyway, you know, we shouldn't be retreating right. to our basements. We saw what happened to American culture that had a, a that had a Christian retreatist mindset, like well, Jesus, Jesus is coming back any time, so uh, let's not build anything. Oh, and then you know the 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 wicked came and it's like, well, we'll tear stuff down while you're not building anything, and so we, we're seeing the naturally end product of that. But there's there's something else that I want to highlight. Um, can I tell a story real quick? Sure. Okay. So you're you're making me realize that there have been a number of touch points throughout my life um, where I've encountered Christianity. I've never. This is brand new thought that just came into my head right now, um, including a story that I haven't told before. So a lot of people know that I went to a Catholic high school, I went to Brophy here in, here in Phoenix. So it's a Catholic Jesuit high school. 
So I, 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 w- I took some classes in theology as part of the curriculum, but I wouldn't say that anything really landed, right? So sure. th- like there were masses that we were required to go to, but I don't know that I walked away from those four years having any understanding about Roman Catholicism or why I should be a part of it. That's you know probably how they managed to run things back then. I don't know. But then, um, I, mean, I mean, they probably they weren't super evangelistic. Like they sure. knew I was Jewish. Like they they accept everybody, you know, of all faith backgrounds. But there was never a moment where I felt like any of the administrators or priests like sat down. It's like, well, can I tell you about Jesus Christ? Like that never happened. I would have been mm-hmm. interested in that conversation. Um, but then uh, in two thousand and I'm going to go with two thousand and one, two thousand two, summer two thousand two. Um, I was living in Berkeley and I was going through a really tough time. And I reached out to a friend of mine that I had worked with in the startup that I worked for. He and I, I was the marketing director and he was the graphic designer. And we sat back to back together for like two years. And he was, he was a evangelical Christian and he would be doing graphic design all day and out of nowhere go, praise God, you know, <laughs> right? Like out of nowhere. And so like, I found it really entertaining. All my, this is in the Bay area. So a lot of people around me are like, he's super weird being evangelical Christian, like, of like, ah. I, I enjoy, we had a good relationship. I was going through a really hard time and I reached out to him for help. And he basically like compelled me to say the sinner's prayer, right? Like just repeat these words after me. And I was so much in need that I'm like, okay, fine. Cause I knew that he had, he had been, he had learned not to try and push me at the time, you know, just cause we were working together and, and that was where I was at. But I was in such dire straits that he made me say the sinner's prayer. And then it was like the end of the conversation done. Good to go. Okay, cool. You're saved now. You know what I mean? And there was no follow-up. Right. There was no, like, you want to start coming to church? There was nothing like that. It's like, I said the mat- I said the prayer and it was good. Obviously it wasn't good because then of course I got even further in the new age and stuff like that. But then I went to Burning Man and I met that, that evangelical group that ultimately did end up baptizing me, who I love dearly. I love my friend. I love my friends dearly. Um, and there hasn't been a ton of discipleship from them either. They're from more of a charismatic kind of tradition, right? So there hasn't been check-ins like, hey, can we talk about doctrine? You know, what are you believing? It, that hasn't been part of it. Now, we don't live together. Like, they're up in Idaho. They're, they still care about me very much, but there hasn't been much investment in discipleship. So it wasn't until I sat down, and this is all in God's providence, it wasn't until I sat down in Apologia and learned about TULIP, learned about the doctrines of grace. And then I started talking to you. And then I started reading the Westminster. That was like, oh, here's active discipleship pouring into believers, particularly in my case, a man helping to grow me up in the faith. And so as you're talking about post-millennialism and you're talking about this maturity of the faith that men need to aspire to, the whole context of the conversation, this is what grows you up into a full mature believer able to take responsibility for and disciple yes. others. And the idea of having a retreatist mindset, having a, you know, having a pre-mill, the end times kind of mindset doesn't inspire that level of investment. Why invest in someone? Just make sure they've got the bare minimum sorted out and come to church every week and sing a few songs. And, you know, hopefully I'll see you next week before the rapture, right? Versus an approach that says, (laughs) you know, right? No, guys, we're going to be here for a while, right? right? Get comfortable, build systems of righteous and godly security and take dominion. But that requires discipleship. And so many churches are devoid of that basic investment in men and women's in different ways, but in in our context, men, men's spiritual growth. And I think that there are so many men that are hungry for that. Yes. I think one of the things that's important is going back, you know, early on in this conversation, we talked about, you know, Exodus 18 lays out this principle that there's supposed to be representational councils of elders. But one of the things it lays out is a ratio there of Mm. one elder for 10 households. Mm-hmm. And so in those 10 households, not just 10 households, but for 10 men, very specifically, 10 men. Mm-hmm. Um, and the idea being that you know, the, the philosophy of ministry you know, that we see so much is not only is there not typically uh, this idea of needing a representational percentage, but also you typically have heads of house kind of being circumvented as opposed to um, the pastoral philosophy being the focus on the man and to preach to the men and teach the men engage with them as pastors of their own home, yeah. there's sort of this desire to please the church lady um, and, you know, to kind of have the youth ministry and cordon off the kids and the women's ministries and all that kind of stuff, as opposed to going, the man is the head of his house and we have a duty to lead the men and to have the men lead their homes. Um, and so, you know, it's just so much easier to just instead go around them 
and mm-hmm. get the affections of their of their wife and children. Um, and that's that's sort of you have this sort of standard vision of the alienated man, you know, who's kind of bored at church. And I think that's because of the fact that we don't lead through that. So I think this idea of discipleship uh, that you're talking about, you know, that's also even manifested in how pastoring works, uh, mm-hmm. where there's a failure to see houses put into good order and to multiply there. And the goal, you know, I talk about you know, the kind of the philosophy of ministry. My goal is to say, I want to push every man to become elder qualified. Mm-hmm. Um, you, know, you go to First Timothy 3, and that lists out the qualifications of deacons and elders, and the goal is to push men to grow. They could they could have those things, and you know, you kind of about, talk about Proverbs thirty one women. I'd say you know First Timothy three men. Um, you're trying to see that manifested, and so this this uh, need for fighting um, and the need to see you know post millennialism, we have this hope where we go we can fight and win, mm-hmm. um, and you know I'm, I'm sometimes I'm pretty impressed at how much fighting I see from guys who think they're going to lose. I'm kind of like looking around at a lot of evangelicals who think they're going to lose, and it's like. Wow, I mean, you guys, you guys are still fighting. I mean, you think you're gonna, you, you know, the law tells you to fight, and you're fighting, you know, but uh, but you you're, you kind of don't expect to win, mm-hmm. and so I'm impressed by that in a lot of ways. But this idea that obviously it's easier to motivate people to fight if they have expectation of winning, mm-hmm. um, and I think that that's a part of the power of not only Calvinism but postmillennialism is we go, God's going to convert people, and God's going to make it so that we win, mm-hmm. um, and and I think this idea that the way we do that is by having you know, holy institutions where we're very carefully guarding the boundaries. And I think that um, we don't want to be retreatist. Um, we want to build places and then project out. Mm-hmm. And also, we don't want to be whorish. We don't want to let people in. We don't want to have, give our affections away and give our loyalties away. We have to be holy, right? So we have to be holy, and we have to be focused on seeking to advance the mission. And so I think discipling people who are strong enough to go out and fight. And I think, you know, First John has this great kind of idea of there's children in the faith, there's, there's kind of the infant, you know, the immature, they need the milk of the word, they need to be protected. Uh, there's the young men who are strong and starting to fight, and they need to be trained to become more effective. And there's the fathers, and the fathers in the faith are the ones who are more mature and who are able to lead in the fighting and also to help to develop fighters to become more mature. Mm-hmm. And so I think every man an elder, every man a father, is the goal. Mm. So let's let's talk about let's talk about some of these issues. So um, so let's first let's talk about holy first because I'm reading the book um, the other worldview by Peter Jones, sort of like one ism versus two ism. Mm-hmm. It's a great it's a great overview, great starter book, highly recommended. He has a wonderful discussion of holiness in here as juxtaposed with the oneist view, which is more wholeness, which we don't have to get into right now. But let's talk about let's talk about holiness and what it means to be. Uh, let's I won't I won't feed the answer to you. Let's talk about that first of all. Sure. So, man is the image of God. The image of God is rationality. If you're rational, you have thought content, purpose, and you make choices. Um, properly formed thought content is knowledge. Um, and so we're renewed after the image of Christ. We're renewed after the image of God as we are renewed in knowledge. Um, properly formed purpose is holiness. Uh, being set apart unto God, and that if that you, you're going to be focused on the goal of the glory of God, and you're going to be focused on on the team, team glorify God, mm-hmm. and team glorify God is also known as the church, um, and then you're going to those who govern in the church are going to be concerned to try to again use the processes and methods of discipline to deal with things to maintain a holiness there. Then there's righteous, there's choices, and choices that are properly formed are righteousness. Mm. So knowledge, holiness, righteousness. So holiness is sort of what flows out of, of, of wisdom or of right knowledge is going to be right purpose. As you define the good properly and you understand God is the good and therefore the good life is the life of possessing more of what's good, God. You possess more of God by knowing him more. Right? If the knowledge of God is how you possess him and then you see the earth filled with the glory of God by spreading the knowledge of God and by acting in such a way as to as to manifest, you know, testimony more powerfully um, and to, you know, make it so that there's Christian culture and you're going to make choices that help to advance that cause. Right? That's righteousness. So holiness is that. And corporately, holiness looks like, um, you know, in households, if you got um, a woman that's just destroying the house or a husband that's just destroying the house um, and they're not willing to repent and they're not willing to dwell together in a manner that makes it so the household can even function, you know, Ezra and Nehemiah forced some people to divorce. 
Um, and so that was to prevent the horse, the house from being destroyed. Hmm. Um, um, there's this, you know, children that are in rebellion, uh, that won't, that won't see, that won't dwell in, in a Christian way. The idea of disinheritance, or you've got a son that's so out of control that the civil magistrate, uh, needs to deal with him. You have that of example as well of this idea of you get this rebellious son. He won't be corrected. He's, he's striking and cursing his parents, whatever. And the civil magistrate could even put to death to prevent this guy from going out and harming society. If the parents can't even control the guy. Um, and so you have this idea of restraining evil. Um, and in the church, you have removing officers, and you have discipline, and you have excommunication. Um, and then in, in the state, you have the sword uh, to deal with protecting what is good. And so these are all these mechanisms of authority. And it starts with self-government, and this idea of, of you seek wisdom. Your goal is to then focus on seeking what's good. And then your goal is to use the means that are established in the law of God. And we talked about the confession and the shorter catechism, but the larger catechism has this amazing section mm. on the law that explains the Ten Commandments in great detail with all these verses for helping to think about proper choices for being able to seek to glorify God. And so holiness is the set-apartness from the world, set-apartness to the goal of the glory of God, set apartness from the flesh, trying to devote yourself to make your body a weapon of righteousness and what a weapon of wickedness. And, and so this, this idea of devotion to the glory of God and seeing the glory of God advanced, that's what holiness is. Amazing. Yeah. To be a people set apart, right? Yes. Be, yes. To be in the world, not of the world. And that's one of the things that I think the church has struggled with is to, is too much worldliness, a desire to be accepted by the culture, to not make waves, to not have conflict, right? To not stand up, you know, f- for true holiness in men's lives. And and I, I love what you said that um, many churches care more about pleasing the women than leading the men. And yeah. and and what a difference it is to be in an environment like a church like yours, where it's clear that you're invested in leading the men, and how different that feels, right? Versus mm-hmm. to be in so many churches where it's like, well, we just want to make sure to not upset anybody. Like no, like break things. They need to, they need to be need to be broken. I, I think one of the practical things that's, that's important there is we've given the vote to women and children that come to the Lord's table in most evangelical churches, and they the, can the, vote on in the church. In the church, yeah, yeah. Um, and and biblically speaking, men of twenty uh, who are in good standing in the church are the ones that should be considered men in the church, and they're the ones that should be allowed to speak and to vote. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a very unpopular position, but it's plainly plainly scriptural. And I would encourage people, there's a great book by Philip Kaiser called Universal Suffrage. It's really short. It's also available for free. as like a PDF online. Uh, but and Philip Kaiser is a great resource. You know, I think the Apologia guys uh, and, and, yeah, and Dominion books Covenant back Church. Here somewhere. Yes. So, yeah. so Philip Kaiser, a great resource I would encourage people to check out. Um, and um, and I've, I've been really blessed by him, and he's been kind to me personally as well, when I've asked him for like notes on something that I've been preparing sermons or whatever, I go, do you have a timeline of this? Whatever. It's like, here you go. And, like, you just, <laughs> and so I, sometimes I'll just have in my handouts, just like, here's this thing from Philip Kaiser. I couldn't improve on it. Just take it, mm-hmm. you know? And so that, that kind of stuff. Um, so anyway, sorry, his book, Universal Suffrage is, does a really good job of laying out the biblical idea of men voting as representatives of the home uh, and representing the, the women of their household and their children um, and so I think that one of the ways you can practically help to create a culture where you actually seek to honor the leadership of the men over their homes is to have that. I think God gave that idea on purpose, and that way the men are the ones that you you know have to worry about, um, mm-hmm. and the, the men are the ones where you're, you're, they've got some power. Um, and so it, it makes it so that they're the ones who can remove officers. Um, and the other thing is the idea of speaking. You know, a lot of conservative you know, evangelical churches will say well, women shouldn't shouldn't speak in the church. Um, but they don't allow the men to speak at all. Um, and, and the two places where the men are supposed to be able to speak are in the public governance meeting of the congregation where they can deal with some of the, those votes. And, um, and then also this idea of the ability to ask a question or raise an objection uh, for public teaching. Um, and so I would really encourage pastors and men to you know, have discussions about that in their churches um, to, to talk about the idea of, of the importance of, of having their constitutional form only allow the men to vote and the men to speak, and then having a method whereby questions, objections um, are, can be brought up uh, in terms of the, the public teaching as it's as it's occurring uh, on the spot. And people are really worried about that becoming, you know, going sideways real quick or whatever. 
you, you can make basic rules of order. You can limit how many questions are going to occur or whatever. And you can also make it so that after a question or two, if one person is still not satisfied, you go, okay, we're going to discuss this on the side and we'll come back and give a report to the congregation on the resolution of the issue. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are the things I would encourage people to think about. Um, and you find in the scriptures, the public teaching of Jesus Christ and of the apostles, you find them interacting with people and you will find you know, questions and objections get raised in the public, the public resolution of those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the picture that's overall being painted here, which I think men can hear, is the godly life takes work. Don't yeah. just sit and passively consume. Right, don't, I go into church and I listen to the sermon and I take communion, and then I go home. It's like, no, no, no. Like you're supposed to be active. You're supposed to be wrestling with God, right? Yes. You're supposed to be wrestling with doctrine. You're supposed to be wrestling with thorny moral or historical questions, and and that's a joy. Like, and then you don't really lose <laughs> when you do that. Right. You know what I mean? You may have something that is, is occupying your mind, but by working through it, you have an answer that's purely, in a sense, your own. You, you get that piece of it. And not to simply be passive consumers. And I think I see, I, I, I see what I think is a lot of passive consumer Christians, right? That yeah. have been cultivated to be that way rather than active, we'll say, combatants, both with culture and with doctrine. Yes. And I think, you know, going back to this holiness idea, you look at the temple, you had like instruments in the temple. And mm -hmm. one of that might be, for example, knives or forks or something that are used in the process of the sacrifices. If it's not being used, it's not holy, right? It, it's, it, it, to be holy, it has to be used for the purpose it's set apart for. Mm -hmm. And if it's and if it's used for something else, it's not holy. Right? So holiness is not sitting around like a lump on a log, just going, I'm not going to do any evil. Right? We have to not only put off evil, but we put on what is good. Mm -hmm. so be, we want to be devoted to good work of glorifying God. The good life is not just a life of avoiding evil and then being idle. You know, idleness itself is evil. Mm -hmm. right? We need to be devoted to good work. And it's, you know, and we all know there's a real problem of boredom. If you don't do anything, like it's boring. Work is glorious. One of the great things about work is that it's interesting. And, you know, that's why all the things we do that are not work that we're trying to fill our time with are pretend work, right? Like, you know, if we're, you know when, when you play with kids, you know, they're pretending to work. They're fighting dragons. They're, they're you know, they're, they're building things. They're rescuing people. They're whatever. And they're, they're pretending to accomplish work. And so, you know, when you when you engage in good works, you're doing something useful, and it's interesting, and the world is interesting, and creation is interesting, and God's plan is interesting, and God is interesting. So exploring these things, trying to study, trying to understand, communicating to other people, teaching to other people, organizing people to do work, all that stuff is fascinating. Mm -hmm. It's glorious. It results in good things. It yields fruit. And so I just, I think that People think this is boring and awful or whatever. It's just it's glorious. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's so much more interesting than when I you know used to waste time spending lots of time playing video games or whatever. Right? Like just, it's so much more awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's 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 make this practical then, because a couple of the things that I've learned from you regard uh, sabbatarianism and tithing, and how and how the way that people think about those things is like things we have to do, but instead thinking about them in terms of things we get to do. Yes. So I believe, you know, in the fourth commandment, right, you have, you're given six days to work. And so you're doing the ordinary dominion work during that time. And there's all sorts of awesome stuff to do. And then the Sabbath is a day that's supposed to be a feast day of the word, right? Where you go, you are, everybody gets to live as though they were a wealthy man who could be a scholar, right? You go, I'm, I'm so luxuriant in my condition in life that I can put off work and I can go study. Uh, there's a, there's a song, you know, if I were a rich man, uh, mm -hmm. from, uh, how, what's the Fiddle on the roof. Fiddle on the roof, right. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. he says, and the best part is I'd spend seven hours every day, you know, uh, discussing the holy book. And it's mm -hmm. like that idea, like people used to think of like, if I were rich, I could go and really devote myself to studying great culture and blah, 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 blah. Now we're like, if I were really rich, I could just hang out and drink Mountain Dew and play video games all day. Ooh, and <laughs> it's like, no, no, you, you would get bored from that and you'd, you'd want to be able to get something more meaty. So the Lord's Day is a feast day for the soul where you get to go and consume the bread of life in just huge proportions, mm -hmm. where you get to go and study the word of God and you get to talk about it with other people. And so studying together, talking together, having this shared preaching, having this, this, this kind of day that's devoted to this life of people who are together studying and seeking to apply these things, it's this everybody gets to be like the rich man who doesn't have to work. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what the Sabbath is. It's a day of freedom. It's a day of, of liberty 
to be able to glorify God in a deep way. So you have this day devoted to the worship of God, and every day is a day for working in one way. Uh, but the, there's a holy work. It's, it's a, it, we rest from our ordinary work and recreation so that we can be devoted to the worship of God. And so your goal is to figure that out. And everybody goes, you know, all the exceptions. Like, well, what if somebody's injured? Can I help them? And all this other stuff. And you go, well, Jesus addressed all this. Mm-hmm. And the point is, yeah, yeah, you do all the necessary work. You feed yourself. You know, you get cleaned up for the day. You do all, you do all the ordinary necessary things to go about the day. And you do work of mercy to help people, to relieve them from present afflictions so that they can enjoy the Sabbath better too. But you're thinking of those things as things that are interrupting the feast. You don't, you don't say, well, I'm not going to do that because I'm feasting. You go, no, I have to do this. I need to do this. I need to do the work of necessity. I need to do the work of mercy. And this is good. And these are good things. And I'm, and I'm glad I get to do these things. But I want to get back to the feast. I want to get back to worshiping God. I want to get back to these elements of worship so that I can, so that I can make my soul fat with the good things that the Lord has revealed to us. Right? And that's sort of this idea. Mm-hmm. And so that's the Sabbath. And as a result, it makes you have to count the time. Because you, when you remember the Sabbath... You become a project manager. When you don't have a Sabbath, you're just kind of like one day bleeds into the other. You can use any day you like the way you want. Maybe work becomes a thing. You're like, oh, no, I need the weekend to go chase down recreation. But but once you have the Sabbath, you go like, okay, I have six days till the next Sabbath. What can I get done in there? And so you become this project manager. You're accounting for the time, and you're going, there's this drumbeat of the Sabbath. And I would also say, you talked about reading the Word daily. You have morning and evening worship. And I would say, you know, if, if you worship God in private and if you've got a family, you're leading your family in worship too. So you've got the private worship and the family worship as drum beats for the day. And then the Sabbath is this big bass note that's helping you to keep rhythm uh, through time. And so I think that makes you a project manager to think about the time, to number your days and remember your finitude. Um, and so with, with tithing, it's sort of the same thing where you go, my, inf- my resources aren't infinite. And, and you, you count it and you say, I'm supposed to give a tenth of this to God, a tenth of my increase to God. So you, you give that to the church. You laid it at the feet of the officers is the way it's talked about in Acts or this idea of the temple, which is a, obviously a type pointing forward not only to Christ but also to the church. So you have this idea of, of the money going in. There's three purposes for the tithe money. It's to, uh, to, to provide for officers. It's to provide for equipping the saints to do ministry. It's like a place to meet in, for example. And for mercy ministry, orphans, widows, those who are disabled, those who have temporary disaster that they need help. Um, so that's the purpose of those money. So you devote that money for that purpose, and what it does is it makes it so the church is is focused on its purposes. If its resources are devoted to that purpose, and and it also makes it so that you go, I don't have an infinite amount of money in my hands, but the Lord does. He owns the, th- the cattle on a thousand hills, and, and and so if I give this to Him and recognize He owns everything, um, then now I know He has everything, um, and I'm going to rely upon Him to provide. And it makes you count your money. Mm-hmm. And so he makes us an accountant, not a project manager only, but also now an accountant. And so you know, capitalism comes out of this idea of the managing of time and the managing of resources as well. And so there's all this dominion work that occurs there. But as you think about it, you go, okay, 90 cents out of every dollar I gain, I get to steward in a way that's distinct from that 10% I give to God. I give them the first fruits. I give them the first of it. And, and, and so then the rest of it now, I need to intelligently apply it. So you're forced to figure out your total resource set with tithing because you have to give a tenth. And then you know what the rest of it is, and that makes it so you're inherently going to be drawn to managing it more. Mm-hmm. And so there's this way in which it makes you grow up. It, it, it makes you have to think about work in a different way. So you have my time, my money are limited, and I need to devote them to the things that matter. And, and it makes you stop wasting both. So the neat thing is that people go, oh, I don't want to give up my Sunday. I don't want to give up the Lord's Day. Well, first of all, you're not giving up, it's His. But secondly, <laughs> um, but secondly, it's going to make it so you stop wasting time nearly as much as you were, and you're going to start finding that you have more time, but you're also going to feel like, wow, the reality is there's so much that I should be doing that I'm failing to do, that you're going to also feel stretched. So it will stretch you, it will make you realize you have more time, it will make you use the time better, and you will find that the Sabbath becomes a delight to you. And there's a promise associated with the Sabbath. It says, if you keep the Sabbath, if you call it a delight, right, then you will ride the high places of the earth. There's a promise of power for it, dominion. And with the tithes, the promise is if you tithe, that your barns will overflow. So there's these promises of prosperity, these promises of power that come with keeping the Sabbath and tithing. And if those things, if the Lord tests you in this life and doesn't give you those in a way that you receive in this life, that's because he's going to bless you even more at the last judgment if you do those things in faith for his glory. There's always going to be a reward at the last judgment. 
and pro, pro, and generally there's a reward in this life. Mm-hmm. I can say specifically the keeping the Sabbath has made a huge difference. The idea that all that day, no, no work, delight in the word, like take really take it, take it easy. Right. And so that, and, and the know that I, I won't send emails on that day. I don't reply to anything. I don't engage with social media. Like I'm off. And my clients have known that the men in my men's group have known that I'm off. No work that day. Right. And, and how relaxing it is. Like when I experience a temptation, like, nope, not going to do that. Just gonna sit and read, mm-hmm. you know, just going to sit in, in, in quiet right before, before going to church. And that recharges me to a degree where it's like, oh, I can get back at it on Monday. And I feel that refresh and I feel that rhythm of the week. And it does force me to have to be uh, more precise in my time because I don't have seven days a week. I got six days. And if in that six days, I want some specific leisure time, well, I got a budget for that too. It gives a whole structure to my week, which forces me to grow up, right? And not just in a sense of like, grow up, quit being so mature, but like grow up and be and take on more responsibility, Yes. And, and this gets back to the to the the failure to lead men, like pleasing the women versus leading the men. Like this would be a job that a husband or a father would be doing, and like there are rules that we now have to follow because we keep the Sabbath day holy, so we don't get to do these things on Sunday, which means we have to do our Saturdays different. Oh, we don't like that. Well, guess what? Like I'm the father of the house, so I get to say this, and then you start getting into submission and headship, and then it's like, oh, no wonder this stuff isn't happening, right? Because we don't. We want to keep our easy, immature kind of lives. And we all want that. All of us, right. you know, can be boys in our own way and, and little girls in our own way. Like, so it's not, it's not, a, it's, it's shared. And yet there is still that call to maturity that we need yes. to, that we need to aspire to. Right. And, and when, and the neat, one of the neat things is, as you propagate these in a church. So like for me, you, know, you who teach, do not teach yourself, right? Like when, when, you, right. when you teach, like you, you learn it deeper. But the other thing is now you're accountable to other people who've heard you t- say it. Now you've got to be there. So if I'm tempted to to not keep the Sabbath or whatever, like I've got a church of people I've taught that we need to do this thing. And so now I'm pushed to have that with external things. And and then you teach, you know, men teach their wives this. And the wives are like, well, you told me to do this thing and you're not doing the thing. And you right. go, oh, I got to do the thing. And then you teach your kids and your kids are like, you know, out of the mouths of babes, right? You teach them these truths and they're just like, that right there, that's not Okay. <laughs> you know, they become external consciences. And it's so amazing the way you kind of build out the culture and it's self-reinforcing. And we want that, right? We, we, if you want to be a man of integrity, if you want to be a man who's wholly devoted to the glory of God, you want external things that are going to encourage you to righteousness rather than tempt you to wickedness. Mm-hmm. And so we, we pray for the Lord to lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. And that prayer, that, that petition has two elements there, those petitions that we look at. Lead us not into temptation. We're saying, the Lord, help to remove the external temptations to evil. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're asking for this idea of, like, let, let's put things in good order. Let's make it so as opposed to, like, a billboard that's like, pornographic, we've got a billboard that's, you know, honoring of marriage. How about that? Christ right? is Which Lord. Which one's going to... <laughs> and so, and then on the other side, you go, and deliver us from evil. We're praying that the, the tempting of Satan, but also that the, the, the tempting of the flesh, the internal element, would be subdued, mm-hmm. right? And so we want, yeah, we want to be holy inwardly. And we want to also put the externals in order in such a way as to encourage it. So we want both. And so sometimes people will go, oh, that's just hypocrisy. That's not holiness or whatever. It's like, no, holiness is going to care about the internal and the external. Mm-hmm. Hypocrisy is only going to care about the external. Let's care about both. Mm-hmm. Amen to that. So so for men and women who are listening, and they're, which, I, which I, I hope that they're getting the overall context and what this conversation is saying about a version of the Christian faith that they may have never heard of or never seen, but that is ultimately so much more nourishing to the mind, soul, body, spirit, all of these things. Like I find this, I find the the picture that you're painting extraordinarily nourishing to all aspects of me as a, as a person. Right. And, and um, I, th- I, to people who are listening to this and who are experiencing that as well, or who, who will, you know, let these ideas settle in, in because some of them could be confronting or new over time will begin to get a picture of the faith that they maybe haven't had before, but maybe their church doesn't adhere to any of this. What would you recommend they do? They're part of a community that doesn't do well, hardly any of it. Maybe it's a, it's a faithful church in its own way, but you know, maybe they don't talk about Sabbatarianism. Maybe they don't talk about tithing. Maybe, maybe they're not even post mill. We'll assume they're Calvinistic, right? Well, we'll give them that. But like, what do you, what advice would you have to people who are feeling inspired by this conversation 
but are in communities where it wouldn't necessarily be supportive. Sure. So we, I listed earlier sort of like the essentials of the Reformed faith, right? And again, that's the you know, solus tulip, trinity, incarnation, and the really basic elements of, of the covenant theology. If there's a denial of those things, then it's not a church, and you need to bring that to your elders in terms of a, we, this is, we're, we're denying the gospel here, we need to assert the gospel. Go through process, and if there's ultimately a refusal and there's no place to appeal, you, you have a duty to pull your family out of there and to find a more faithful church. If it's a church that's not that, okay, then there can be a lot more patience. Okay, So if, you, if you've got the solus tulip, trinity incarnation, and the really basic element of the head, federal headship of Adam and Christ, then what, what you've got is you, you need to appeal to Scripture and you need to honor your, your elders and you need to work through this process of trying to you know, come to them and, and you need to think about this and go, which things are most basic here? Like, like what, what, are the, what are the doctrinal issues that are, that are the most foundational of the things where there's a problem? Right? You might go, there's problems, problems everywhere, and you know, I don't know how to solve it all. And you go, well, okay, that's true of you too. <laughs> Right, <laughs> maybe it's, tr- it's true of me. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, like, so, so we, we go. Okay, so you you try to find the most important, most foundational problem and try to tackle that, and you do that by bringing the issue. You you you, you consider it, you study it, you pull the scriptures together, and and you bring the issue in an honoring way uh, to the elders and say, "We're not doing this. I think we need to, we need to do this." And and so you know, you talk to me about your perspective on it. And you talk to them about it. Now, if ultimately they just kind of go, eh, I don't care, we don't need to deal with it, and it's and it's a clear teaching or commandment of God, you know, you go through process and you and you if you have a, a more pure church that you could be a part of, and there's ultimately not a willingness to seek to reform, then you know, after going through process in a peaceable way, you're not going to say, well, you're not a church, you're not a Christian. It's like, no, we've already established they have Illegal the same assembly. gospel. Illegal <laughs> assembly. Right, right, right. We've already established they have the same gospel. Yeah, yeah. You know, so so if, if that's the case, then, then what you're doing is you're seeking to peaceably depart in such a way as to both leave it with clarity as to what you think they're doing wrong and why from the scriptures, but you're also seeking to then, you know, join a more a more pure assembly uh, that has the, the doctrine, worship, and government in a, in a better condition. And if there's there's not a church that you can be a part of where you are. It's not. It's not willing to go through the process of reformation because reformation. You know, let's say, let's say that on the positive side, let's say they do this. Let's say they say, okay, we're going to study that. We're going to consider it. We're going to talk about it. And you go, great. Okay, a few months on the line, let's say they start to, to to apply some of those things. And you see reformation. You go, okay, there's more stuff on the list. Okay, celebrate, encourage, and now sort of also help to go to the next thing. And so there's this kind of persistent pressure for reformation. Um, and, and as long as there's progress and a willingness to go through Reformation, I think that we should be uh, seeking to encourage that. But if there's not a willingness to meet, not a willingness to discuss, not a willingness to see the progress, then we need to uh, be seeking to be a part of a more pure assembly or to potentially start one. And so if there's not anyone you can, you can join that's, that's nearby that is more in alignment with these things, then what I would say is you consider... Is there anybody I can work with, and is there any? And am I am I in a condition where I'm, I'm elder qualified, where I could potentially seek to to start one here, or do I have duties that make it so I'm, I have to be here, where I need to start one? All right, those are the things to consider, and that, there's a lot of questions to consider there, but that's the short version. Mm-hmm. And then you go alternately: is there one? Is there a good church that I could move to? Um, and so you're either you're either joining one by finding one near you, or you're joining one by moving and and be t- participating, or you're helping to start one. Mm-hmm. And the starting one, you don't you just ordain, you don't you just ordain yourself, right? What you do Please is don't people do start that. to meet together. People start to meet together. They covenant together. Then there's a process of nominating, testing, electing, and ordaining by the setting apart of a man. Um, and and so those are the, that's that's the process. So if you don't have, if there's nobody who's been commissioned to go plant a church, the way a church gets formed is by covenanting together of members. And then in that process, you then look uh, you, you look to nominate test, elect, and ordain men in that context. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are those are sort of some of the key things there in terms of how that process goes. So I don't know if I covered more than no. you were hoping for in that piece. but No, that's great. I wanted to talk real quickly about the, the process of Reformation and how important it is that, um, that a church uh, be willing to do that, that a man be willing to do that, that any body be willing to do that, because what happened with the Protestant Reformation is that the Catholic Church refused to be Reformed. They, re- they yeah. refused, right? And uh, the same is true for Eastern Orthodoxy, that when I think it was Luther or Calvin started writing, or someone started writing the Eastern Orthodox Church, 
and they basically just like said, don't ever talk to us again. Right. And so, I mean, that's basically what happened, like go away and don't ever come back. Right. So, so these are examples of two large institutions that refused being reformed. And so now what you're seeing, uh, you know, in Rome is Rome is having some pretty serious problems at the highest level of the magisterium with the popes and the cardinals and this massive liberalizing push. And when you look at Eastern Orthodoxy, what you're looking at is doctrine that hasn't really changed for what, like 1700 years. They're still practicing like this ancient form of Christianity saying about, maybe it's a little bit less than that, but still saying that, oh, this is the most pure version. It's like, no, it hasn't been reformed. It desperately needs to be reformed because you're practicing something where doctrine has been refined for hundreds of years. And yet you're holding on claiming that it's pure and it's not because you've refused reformation. And so what happens is when individuals refuse reformation, they end up in all these kind of strange places or they they reject the opportunity to grow in ways that they need to. So in the same way yeah. that you know a church needs to accept the ability to be reformed and submit to that process, so do we as men. And this is equal weights and measures, right? So like we are free to criticize or lovingly criticize and offer each other the opportunity to reform. That's what we do as men when we care about each other and women yes. as well. And churches should be willing to hear that also, but they're not. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think a part of the reason for that is that churches are, you know, churches view view change toward the Word of God as sort of dangerous in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. And a part of that is sort of the like cult of personality, the you know having the guy. And, and I think one of the things I've tried to to, to really encourage um, is for for people to think about this idea that one of the neat things about a representational system where you have a certain number of elders based upon the number of men that is laid out again in Exodus eighteen is this idea that it that it it's it makes it so there's not just a guy. It makes mm-hmm. it so that there's there's multiple men, um, and it helps to it helps to reduce you know, putting our trust in men as teachers mm-hmm. uh, and, and having the ultimate desire to have multiple teachers in a particular church. I think it's one of the things that I really love about apologia. I mean, you guys have basically um, you know you have you have Pastor White and and Pastor Durbin getting up there and. And you'll sometimes have Pastor Pearson and then Pastor Morgan, and you'll have other people who are men who are either being trained or, or uh, who have been sent off and are coming in. But there's this a, a, I've, I've heard all sorts of good sermons from, uh, you know, I don't know if he's pastor or Mr. Conover, and uh, mm-hmm. uh, even, uh, you know, there's a, there's a deacon who was in training who I've heard a sermon from. I mean, just this idea of a rotation of, of, of people teaching who are men who are either being trained who are already in office of elders. And that rotation through makes it so that you're you're not totally dependent upon a single teacher, and it's not it's just not the guy. Instead, it's here is the truth, and we're all seeking to to speak through that. So this idea of having multiple people teaching through to help to avoid the single um, you know the guy, mm-hmm. and, and I think that that is a part of what allows for there to be reformation. Then you want to have public debate in terms of the court of the church. So the public worship, you have more than one person who's teaching. And then there's also sort of this the, the public debate that occurs in governance and govern, governance meetings uh, where those things can occur, and that helps to allow for there to be uh, that. And along with this idea of being able to raise the questions or, or comments, those things are all the mechanisms of the wisdom of God's law that help us to see uh, avoiding of this calcification around the traditions of men, uh, but allow us to not only be reformed, but to be always reforming. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Well, we've certainly given people um, a lot to chew on, and I think that that's a that's a lot to work through. So, um, so just to just to wrap up, just a couple questions. So, as men are thinking about some of the issues, men and women are thinking about some of the issues that we've raised today. They're looking at the Westminster. They're on the Banner of Truth Trust website. And it's like, wow, that's a lot to kind of approach from a start because it is written in kind of like an older style English. Like I think it's like four hundred years old at this point or thereabouts. Like. It's, it can be a lot to approach and, and kind of intimidating if it's your first time. So would there be any books or resources that you'd recommend that might like help pave the way towards towards experiencing some of these things we're talking about? Yeah, there's a lot of ifs in there. Um, you know, so the ends of words. Uh, so yeah, I think, um, <laughs> yes. I think, I think um, the easiest thing to access that's also free um, would be, uh, I, I've done a sermon series through the Westminster Confession of Faith. Uh, okay. So I would encourage people to to check that out. Um, if I were suggesting um, some some books as opposed to just kind of uh, audio material, um, I think that there are there are. I'm trying to pick 
I have to. I'm just going to list three. There's there's sure, three there's three you know commentaries that are that are good on the confession uh, that I would kind of suggest that are available that are in modern English. Um, one is Gordon Clark has a really it, e- easy introductory one for mm-hmm. what the Presbyterians believe. Uh, a. a. Hodge um, has has one that's sort of a little bit more technical, mm-hmm. um, but it's but it's still in you know very modern feeling English. Um, and then G. I. Williamson has a really has a good one that was yep. written. Uh, you know, just I don't know, sixty years ago, something like that, mm-hmm. and it's and it's it's a good uh, a good one. So I, I would those are those are three resources. The easiest one to read is the Clark one. Um, the G. I. Williamson one is is really a good blend of being really good in a lot of places and uh, and e- kind of easy to read. And the Hodge one kind of gives the more a little bit more technical uh, analysis of it. Okay, so one so okay, one more question. Just jumping off of that, so I'm going to ask this on behalf of some of my listeners. So if, if you're, if, if imagine you're speaking to someone who's like, they, they're Baptist, but they're like looking, looking at Presbyterianism, right? They're on that kind of, they're on that kind of train that's going on. Like, what would you, what would you say to them? So what I'd say is, um, first, a resource, um, I think there's a book called of Christ of the Covenants, um, Christ, of, Christ of the Covenants by O. Palmer Robinson. It's, it's a really good one engaging with covenants. You know, covenants, well, we were just talking about, you know, Baptist versus Presbyterian. This is really about baptism. Well, the basic structure of the Bible is is outlined in the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the covenant of works do this and live. Um, the covenant of grace, the just by faith shall live. And the covenant of works is given to us, and we have you know Genesis one and two, and we have Adam and and Eve falling in Genesis three, and breaking the, Adam breaking the covenant of works. Um, and then in Genesis 3, you also have the first giving of the gospel, the first giving of, of the covenant of grace, where God promises grace. And, and then you have that again with Noah in Genesis 9. And then again with Abraham in Genesis 15. And he gives a symbol for that covenant, covenant of grace, in Genesis 17. Um, and it's a, a symbol, circumcision, that's for entry into the covenant as a symbol. And it's for Abraham and his seed. And the children after him are supposed to get it because when you enter a covenant, it is all those you represent as well. And fathers represent their households. Um, parents represent their children. And so you find this sign of the covenant given, and, um, it, and then you, you find that when we get to the Mosaic administration, that continues. It includes you know, children. And earlier administrations included promises to children as well. And then you get to um, you get to this um, you know, the Davidic administration of the covenant. It's all the covenant of grace, and they're just building on each other. Mm-hmm. And then you get to Christ, and He fulfills all of these types, all of these symbols, all of this external way of administering the covenant of grace is fulfilled in Christ. And He gives us simplified ceremonies. And these simplified ceremonies, we have the entry ritual of baptism, we have the renewal ritual of the Lord's Supper, and these simplified ceremonies are given to us, and the subjects of circumcision get added to in terms of we have women now being baptized, but children are never removed. Hmm. And so the connection I want to make is when you read in the scriptures about circumcision and you read about baptism, you find they represent the exact same things. Hmm. And so you have circumcision represents the circumcision of the heart, which is being regenerated. And you find that baptism also represents regeneration. It's the Titus talks about the uh, washing of regeneration, and and so this idea that baptism points to regeneration, but circumcision does too. Circumcision points to Christ. Baptism points to Christ. Circumcision points to the covenant. Baptism points to the covenant. Mm-hmm. Right? And these are these are, they mean they mean the same things. And so I would say that understanding covenant theology, the covenant of works with Adam, the covenant of grace with Christ understanding the symbols of the covenant we call sacraments and understanding that these are symbols that represent the same covenant and that there's a connection and the new ceremonies replace the old ceremonies. They're not just totally disjointed. There's a connection. Mm -hmm. Um, And so this idea that we have baptism as a replacement for circumcision as a sign of the covenant is what I'd want to point people to um, and what I want to say is the way in which the new covenant is a better covenant 
and has better promises is that we have the same promises as in the Old Covenant, but we have more. And the more are promises that there's going to be greater fullness, greater efficacy, greater numbers of people brought in. It's going to go to all the nations. And and so that being the case, the baptism that we have points to the reality that we're in the area of greater fullness. And, and so the, the better promises we should expect to see are basically post-monialism. Amen. What a, what a bountiful answer that exceeded what I could have expected. This is, I know this is a, this is a right field for, for discussion and study, so maybe we should have another conversation where we, where we tackle these issues together because I think it'd be really good to unpack them in a, in a, in a, in a wider format because I think a lot of people are struggling with these questions today. I'd be, I'd be honored to come back, and I'd love to have a conversation about baptism and covenant theology. I think those could be uh, really fruitful there. If anybody doesn't want to go listen to like the 9 million parts that I have in my Westminster Confession series, um, they could check out the like two or three I've done baptism, and that might be helpful to them if they're, if they're thinking about that too. So the book that I mentioned, but uh, also, um, also just those couple of sermons on baptism uh, on the series about the Westminster Confession. Wonderful. I'll send them your way. So where would you like to send people to find out more about you and what you do? I occasionally say crazy things on X. Um, <laughs> and so at Real David Reese is a, is a place where you can uh, follow me and be agitated. Okay. Um, the, the other thing <laughs> is uh, I, Puritan Reform Church uh, is, 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 uh, is PuritanPHX.com. Um, and uh, I'm trying to develop relationships with investors to see more Christian businesses uh, be developed at uh, reesefund.com, which is right now basically a coming soon page, but mm. uh, it'll be coming soon. So uh, if you check it, you'll you'll find something. If you, if you want to talk to me about that before the site is finalized, feel free to email me at uh, dreese at armoredrepublic.com. dreese at armoredrepublic. Great. Thank you so much, Pastor David. This has been this conversation has been an enormous blessing to me, and I'm sure it's been that way to many listeners as well. So thank you so much, sir. God bless you. Brother, thank you for having me on. It's been an honor. Lord bless you.